So welcome everybody here to the Martin Lee Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center of CUNY. My name is Frank Henschke, I'm the director of uh, the Siegel Center and we are here tonight also with Marie Sisko who collaborated, we co-produced and she also co-curated this, what I think very important event. This is right in the center of what we are doing here at the Siegel Center for over 10 years. We have collaborated with Penn and Penn World Voices this year because of all the complications in the world um, there's no Penn World Voices Festival, but we keep our Voices Festival, World Voices Festival alive. And we saw that once again, it's really time to think about, listen to very carefully in a radical listening way to listen to voices uh, from uh, people who were displaced immigrant refugees um, in a way, entire mankind that came out of Africa, went somewhere over the ten thousands or hundred thousands of years. It's actually the story of mankind and we try to reconnect one more time. Um, tonight we're gonna hear nine readings. Some of them are 30 minutes, some of them are 10 minutes, nine altogether. It should be over by 9.30ish. And um, we're really thrilled that you are here. We at the Siegel Bridge Academia and Professional Theater, International and American Theater. And if you look at the names and if the countries which are represented tonight, you will see why some people call us the little United Nations of Theater in, the, in New York. We're extremely proud to have these actors with us, the playwrights. It's a great honor to host it, and we couldn't think of a better uh, uh, theme than the one we have tonight. If you have a cell phone, take it out now and make sure it's off. It should say silent mode on. It never rings in our events. Um, we welcome all our viewers on HowlRound on the great American nonprofit uh, theater platform. Um, now for over 10 years, we collaborate with HowlRound and we would like to thank VJ and Thea for being such great partners. Now, a lot of our audiences, if not the most part actually is online, up to 70% more, but also of many, many countries. Sometimes we have 30, 40 countries uh, tuning in. So I also hope tonight is such an international event. And now I would like to give over to Marie who will tell us a little bit about what this special evening really is about. Thank you, Frank. Good evening, everyone. I'm so excited to see you here today. It's been such an honor to work and partner with Frank and the Siegel Center to curate this evening of readings. Um, we are very excited about what we have to present tonight. When Frank and I first um, chatted, I was very excited about this theme because it is one that is very close to me as a child of immigrants being first generation Liberian. Um, I immediately reached out to my network close and far. We reached out to folks locally and nationally to curate and find writers who we felt were creating stories that were timely, fresh, and innovative. And I believe that is what we are going to present to you tonight. The writers represented here um, are diverse. They are students. Um, they are writers who are far in their career. There are mid-career writers. You'll see full um, companies, 10, nine actors. You'll see solo work. Um, so we are very excited about what you're gonna see tonight. And though they are specific to the writers, I also believe that these pieces are in conversation with one another. Um, the layout of the evening is we will have our first set of readings and then we will do a panel discussion with those writers. And then we will have our young Ukrainian playwrights present their readings and then we will do a panel with just them. Feel free to go to the restroom if you need to. Um, between readings or during readings, do not feel um, chained or locked down to your seats. We will seamless, seamlessly transition between readings um, and just be casual, um, but sit back and relax. And our first playwright up tonight is Raven Cassell, and this is the untitled Pan-African play. Followed that will be Crossing the Water by Rawia El Chab. Um, and then after that, The Kind Killer by Achiro P. Olwok. After that will be Fall by France Luce Benson and then followed by our panel. So now we will have Raven Cassell, the Pan-African, the untitled Pan-African play.
The Untitled Pan-African Play by Raven Cassell. Scene one, the year 2033, about two hours outside of Abidjan in rural Cote d'Ivoire. America no longer exists. The afterlife of the internet, some people made it out of the fires, others didn't, a dinner party. The friends are at the table eating an elaborate dinner that they've potlucked. It feels like Ghana high life. This is Nike and De Desmond's home, a fine eclectic parlor with plenty curious sculptures, instruments, photographs, and paintings about. There's a corner with a record player and collection of records. There are multiple couches, benches, stools, floor cushions arranged to facilitate conversation. There's a book collection and a landline. Desmond gives her a million kisses. Uh -huh. They are in the thick of intense intimacy on the floor, obstructed by furniture and out pops. Ah, Desmond, my yam. Hurriedly gathering the skirt of her big evening dress. Oh no, my yam go burn. She rushes into the kitchen off stage. I want to finish there. Desmond. Nikkei shuffles around in the kitchen. Clash! The sound of a dish. No. No, 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 no. I broke it. She and Desmond look at what's in her hands. Mommy. You have so many things from her, Nikkei. Don't worry. This was the last of her ceramics. Desmond, this was the only thing I brought with us. Ah, and my yam burnt. I'm sorry. Everyone will be here soon. Desmond straightens her dress for her, and she starts into the kitchen. We can still eat the yam. It will be smoky, but it will do. Okay, love. People will be bringing their own dishes as well. Amuna is bringing uh, Kijeno because no one else can make healthy Kijeno like he does. Mamadou and Daoud said they're bringing beer. Yata is coming with some sort of chocolate surprise. Ah, and a cheke. Someone is bringing a cheke. Who is bringing a cheke? Uh, people will bring food. We'll be okay, dear. Of course, dear. And? Uh, oh. They don't taste bad. Very good, actually. I need this to be the best evening. I am starting a new decade, Desmond. I am entering a new story. Desmond grabs hold of her shoulders and looks her square in the eye. Okay. Everything will be fine. You've done enough. You've sold yourself this stunning dress. The house looks incredible and it's your birthday. Jeez, darling. Tonight is going to be perfect. We are all here to celebrate you. And tomorrow we leave for Tuntun, mm -hmm. me and you. One long month in the city. We can have late nights at the beach like we used to in the old world. And your friends, I'm sure you'll see your people. We are okay, Nikki. It's over. You can breathe. <sighs> Many people thought I knew in America who were able to leave before the fall are now displaced. Tacked into different corners of the outer world. Some of my friends who stayed behind pleading with their family members to drop it all and run with the plane while still smoking, ended up stuck, burning in the fires on account of trying to save folks who weren't meant for the new world. I suppose they too weren't meant for the new world then. God knows and didn't leave anyone behind in error. To move is to live. I know. Go breathe. But I wasn't finished. <laughs> we were practicing, baby. Mm. Don't you want us to practice? I want us to start thinking about it for real. Our babies are going to make sure we stay on this earth in one form or another. We can't keep roaming forever trying to piece together what we knew. We have to sow our seeds. I believe I can travel. I believe if I can travel, I, I, I can maybe cross paths with my old people and surely new people. I can't call that sort of happenstance into being if I'm just between here and the beach for all my days. I appreciate it here. Yeah? I appreciate that Desmond and I found each other in the midst of war and showed survival by togetherness. I appreciate 
that he had a family still bound when I lost mine in the fire. And this little house we live in and our little farm on this piquant land and the other little one on the coast passed down by his grandparents. All we really need is water to drink and plants to eat. All else is a luxury. We are just practicing. Just practicing. Desmond takes her hand and they slip into another bout of intimacy. Happy birthday. He kisses her somewhere sweet, maybe her forehead or hand. Her smile says, thank you. It happened before. Me seeing people from the old world. We went to Gold Coast. It was for the year end two years ago, right around the time everything had happened. So people really needed to celebrate. huh? Gold Coast too is where many people escaped, especially in the beginning. The thinking was, that was where most left from centuries ago when they thought it was safe to return. And it was, if I could make it there in sweet in that way, warm, the city, colored golden by the collision between the sun and the sand. It was like they were happy to take in the refugees. That year end was the first without the internet. We were filled with excess energy. So we all just indulged in humanism, food, sex, art, nature. We did it all so hard and so fast that year. Every subsequent year has just been to chase that first tingle of the spine. Huh? We were both mourning our world and celebrating life. The two most fertile grounds for passion. <laughs> They'll start coming any minute now. It's already settled. Desmond goes over to the music corner and fishes for a record. There. He found something. Fela Kuti. Expensive shit by Fela Kuti plays and gives them a pep. Nikkei straightens the place while she tidies in the pocket of the music. I thank the God I hadn't made any children. We were, that we were able to run with both of our arms free. When we left, I was quite prepared. I wasn't planning to leave, but the way it was starting to feel over there made you want to start getting your shit together. What if we just stayed there? Hmm? Just stayed in Tuntun. Made a life there. That, that is... If we like it, but I still like it. What happened to here, Adenike? You made this house perfect. You have your tiles from Morocco. We installed this whole shelving system for all your sculptures. You have a whole studio on this entire yard to sprawl. What happened to here, Adenike? You're right. <laughs> You're right. Nothing. Nothing happened to here. I don't know. What am I saying? Let's have our babies here, yeah? We came so far to be here in this moment. She looks around the place. Yes, Desmond. We have. She hugs him good. No one really knows what happened to the internet. But once it was gone, everything else became perniciously effervescent, eaten by smoke. We had gotten so tightly woven in its threads. And when it vanished, we were just left floating and, and had to remember the survival of intelligence that had lived a few layers beneath our skin but it was there so we used those last weeks to calculate our escape and like everything else in america we will lose it she peers through the curtain out of the window here comes yaka she's always the first one to arrive at the party and the last to leave then open the door for her and no can't look like i'm just waiting here for people to come but you are baby Nike runs off into the kitchen. Desmond shakes his head and opens the door. Enter Yata. Desmond, move from here. It's not your birthday. Where is Mrs. Diallo? I just saw her in the window. I want to see Mrs. Nike Diallo. <laughs> Nike makes an entrance from the kitchen, twirling her ruffled floral power dress. Hey, my people, my people, I love she this. She is here. <laughs> she two cheek kisses Yata. Guess what kind of cake this is? 
I, I, I love this. I love this. I love this. Uh, let me take off your hands. Mm. She takes the dish from Yata. Can you guess? Can you guess what kind of cake this is? Uh, chocolate. <laughs> How did you know my surprise? Uh, you told me you were making a chocolate surprise. Mm. She only ever wants to know what it feels like to be me. She wants to know what it felt like to be in America and to move to the country and most pressingly what it feels like to be married. Today, she wants to know what it feels like to be tattooed. I tell her, I feel alive. Hmm? Like I've had one hell of a childhood and I am finally feeling like I have what it takes to be a grown up. Hmm. Yata stares at her with wide dreamy eyes and a frozen half smile imagining herself in these grown-up shoes. Linda enters in single mother fashion, followed by her boy, Nas, his nose in a book while she totes as many bottles of bubbly her hands can hold. Linda! Hey! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I guess that's the idea. She's my oldest friend I've got. We knew each other before we knew each other. And we are a month apart, 10 days, so my birthday always means her birthday is on it today. And that our mothers kept one another company while they were pregnant and idle in that America. And that I know when we were 13 about dreaming about being 30 together. We somehow made it all the way here. Birthday oh, girl! <laughs> Happy birthday, Antoniki. I wish you a prosperous year. Thanks. I can hear that Beavis and Butthead must be on the premises, huh? There is an African hip-hop version of Happy Birthday being devised in the living room. Happy, happy birthday, yo. You were turning 30, yo. Happy, happy birthday, yo. You were turning 30, yo. Happy birthday, yo. You were turning 30, yo. Happy birthday, yo. The party is here. The boys are back. Arrogant. Me, I'm ready to eat. Okay, let's come. Let's bring this food. Okay. You're leaving for Chun Chun tomorrow. Yeah. I wish I could go with you. Put me in your bag and carry me with you, please. Leaving Cote d'Ivoire means inviting enchanted encounters. Huh? So since Gold Coast, Desmond and I have prioritized travel. They make their way around the massive wooden table. Scene two. Lights up on the group at the table, chatting and chewing and passing around handmade ceramic dishes Nikkei has collected from the city she's passed through like Mankala. I've said it before and I'll say it many times as I have to. None of you would have made it back home if those people didn't ruin that place. Me, I always plan to come back. I just, you know, needed some fire under your ass, eh? Uh, stop it. That's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> These people have been through a lot. Me, I welcome them no matter how they had to get here. Africa is uniting, baby. I mean, honestly, I was one of those people. I, I don't know that I would have ever even vacationed here. I guess it was never that desirable. Bullshit. Mm, see, that's what I'm talking about. Who the hell has to make your home desirable? Mm. And your parents weren't born here. You are African. Mm. Your parents were born here. That's what I mean. It takes literal hell to raise up those sordid lands for you people to return home. Right. Hey, please pass me there, ticket. Looking at us with those sorry eyes, wanting us to receive you a beg. But the first, not the wonderful people seated at the table. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Marcus Garvey said, Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad. And besides, the economic conditions of the continent has directly benefited from the great exodus. Africa has advanced exponentially and unprecedentedly. But obviously, I emphasize with your frustrations. I have no desire to take all black people back to Africa. There are blacks who are no good here and will likewise be no good there. Marcus Garvey, he said that too, eh? The ones who are here are supposed to be here. Nas shoots his eyes up in thought. 
He exits to the backyard to give Wazo what remained on his plate. Well, all I know is this whole thing has ruined my dreams of ever going to America. What do I have to look forward to now? I really envy you people. Envy mm. for what? Most of them had to leave pieces of their families straggling in the States. Their families, so drenched in the poison of Americanism, were paralyzed by the imagination of surviving beyond its borders. They were left to burn in the fires. Not much different than how I crossed this border. No fires, but plenty child soldiers. How long has Yata been going, going? She's never gone. <laughs> See, why did this have to happen for us to get here? Hmm? Why? Why must it have had to be by fire and sword? But we are here now. Hey, And we're happy to have met you. Okay. And you're our student. Uh, <laughs> am I late? Chale, of course you are. <laughs> oh, Mo. Sorry, I beg. Nike, mm. Esma, greetings, everyone. Palm wine, where must I put it? I'll take it. Thank you, Yemi. <laughs> where you they come from? Oh, Tun Tun, oh. <laughs> Adenike and I are headed there this morning. It's our first time. Here, take a plate. Yemi fills his plate and begins on the achike with his hands. Nafs re-enters with an empty plate and passes to the kitchen. You will enjoy. There is nothing like that place. And I have lived all over Nigeria my whole life. And there is nothing like that, Tun Tun. Tell us, Yemi, what is that place like? They say everyone gets around on beautiful, embellished courses. It's a robust refugee town on the fringe of Lagos, born of the Great Exodus. A lot of people fled there from, the, from New York and Los Angeles when the states fell. This peripheral micro city of about 50,000 Neo-Africans, but has the vibration of a billion. Oh. Yata takes a sip of wine. Yeah, people are real well-dressed, wearing the past and the future. And there are plenty conversational cafe, plenty languages being thrown around. And the beach, it's at the end of the city, so you always know where the horizon is. Any given night, there is a fire burning on the beach and live music. They say there isn't one moment in Tun Tun where someone is not dancing. Mm -mm. They say they say you arrive and are met by wailing instruments and a barrage of reds, greens, and blacks. The main road that cuts through Tun Tun is Bill Street. There's a street festival every weekend. Jazz is in the air, double dutch, rap battles, a seamless blend between the two worlds. Hey, hey, down, down, baby, down by the roller coaster, sweet, sweet, baby, I'll never let you go. Shimmy, shimmy, cocoa, what? Shimmy, shimmy, pow. I told you, it's only 10 ekoa dollars on the AIR and five hours from Abidjan. Mm. How much is 10 eco? I told you. And I have never, ever been on the African International Railroad. Never. I don't know what you're waiting for to step into the future, Shah. Abi, now me fall in love with one babe who fled from the fire, oh? I knew there was a reason you couldn't leave from Tun Tun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious about this one. As serious as the last. Huh? Well, Desmond and I are going tomorrow to see what there is for us. Hmm. Uh, if I could go with you to that Tun Tun. I hear the women there possessing all of Africa. That cannot be true. I must go to investigate. Mm -hmm. uh, bring this gram. It they taste like fire. It, it's mm. sweet. Mm. When you they pass the cross. Mm. Mm. Sweet like coal. I don't like to wait, sir. Mm. Nike, this dress. Let's talk about it. Yes, I don't even remember the last time I got an Adi Nike original. Me neither. <laughs> And you made this one just to jealous us, eh? Hmm. Ah, stop it. I have plans. When we come back, I am dedicating one year of the art to it. With the death of the internet, so many of us changed our name and assumed different uh, new professions. It was expected that documentation had banned, so credentials became obsolete. Employers here in Africa took what you presented as your trade at face value. Hmm? Most people dropped their titles they wore in the West and stepped into their soul's work. I still sew. I still use my hands to clothe people. Hey, oh, I have 
plans. I am taking a sabbatical. I spent my whole 30 years here getting painted my cuticles, being an artist again. These years had intention of fight. We needed to make it here and cut our way. And we have. Desmond and I have built this land. We've buried our toes in the dirt. But the fall distanced me from me and my practice. And maybe it had to be that way for us to arrive here. I don't know. But it's no longer. Hey. I am ready. Hey. Uh -huh. Ready to dress people again. Yeah. Hey. Get it, silhouettes. Hey. hey. And lay our textures on your bodies hey. again. Hey. 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 Uh -huh. I'm too uh -huh. hey. I will feel the style and fear of Azenike Diallo. <laughs> I'm telling you, I was there. I saw it. I saw what she did in that America. I have seen the pictures. Show them the photo books. Show it to them. There is a large chest, antique and worn, but not enough to drown the profound beauty of this thing. Yata rushes up the chest and pulls out a large photo book. She shows the group a photo. That was five years ago. It's time, Nike. You have everything you need. A prayer hut on the hill, a freshwater stream, a uh, garden, a papaya tree, a dozen oh, coconut oh, trees. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Demond. Yes, I have plenty. Plenty, plenty, plenty pleasantries. But I have my things to do. I'm just saying, it's time. I'll help you, Nike. I know back in the States, I didn't have much time with the baby, Tish and I, and my job, but it's not like that here. I can help. I do not lead with passion any longer, but it still lives in my cells. Hmm? I design and sew the hospital attire and school uniforms for the people of Abidjan for good money. That way, I can do the same for the local community at Hapcourt. They look very beautiful. That's how I know the fashion is still here in me. I love knowing the function of the clothes. I make, they love. I did love fashion design in the old world too, but when it all fell, I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure out what it really meant. So I rejected fashion. I wanted my hands to be more functional, not to be wasted on vanity. I've never seen this, Nike. You never showed me ah. this. Nike, the huh? fellow is coming. Mamadou and myself need to steal the show. The whole world will be there. We need fashion. I told you, you two need to come to Toon Toon. The music scene, they play. Mm. We they play the village, we they play the city. We have been performing in this village before we could talk, before we were Mamadou and Duwu. We were the Tour A twins. Our mother bought our rice with the money we collected. The only twins in the village. Mm -hmm. Yes, Nike. I want to see what you were Oh, for you too. Okay. Mm. Mm. I will keep it simple. Mm. All the cares will be said when you open your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I would do clean lines mm -hmm. to keep you straight. Mm. Some texture to contrast the silk in your skin. Mm -hmm. mm. Maybe like an off-white canvas. Hey. Uh -huh. Yes. It looks good against the orange sand. Huh? Mm. Hey. I like the end. <laughs> See, that's it. That's what we need. It's what we all need. Tun Tun, it will fix you. It will fix you good. You too. It will fix you too. Since my dreams of ever going to America have scorched, I have somewhere to look forward to now. Well, we are happy to have met you. You're our student. <laughs> yeah, my belly the bust. <laughs> and there is still dessert. Uh, are we finished? They all start taking their dishes out. Scene three. The group sits under the porch lights, ciphering a few joints looking off into the yard. The home is positioned so that we can't see other houses, nor can they be seen by others. See, the problem is, I've got too many married friends. You guys are too noble. Oh, boy. What is marriage other than consent sex? 
Uh-uh. Don't be so sure about that. Ooh. Damn. Kofi. My man. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Conti Desmond finds their bullshit funny. Uh. Okay. We all do. But Desmond is alone to feel no fault in that guilt. Charlie, life gets busy. If you had a real job, you would know. Yeah, you Charlie. wish you could get paid to hold a mic. In this state, Desmond and I like to touch one another. <laughs> it's the anxiety. I like to be reminded that I have someone when my mind is altered and I am not sure what's real. He touches me to remind me he has me. It can be as simple as reaching for his hand, squeezing his pinky finger, and he might squeeze my knee with two pulses. We developed this language when we were running. It was once our only language. Let's play a game. Ooh, I like games. <laughs> what kind? If not here, where would you be? Easy. I'd be in Zanzibar. Mm. On a boat. On my bum. Uh, I mean, I don't think I have much of a choice. Anywhere. Anywhere. Uh... I'd be in Bedside, Brooklyn. <laughs> mm. Like living. Yeah. Mm. Be. South Africa. Maybe Johannesburg. Yeah. Why? The landscape of the region. Mm. I don't know geography. Daoud passes a joint to Nike. Nike takes in a puff of smoke. Where would I be? Mm. My parents perished in the fires. My father did not have any fight enough in him to leave. And my mother would not live with him. And I'd already run once. Ah. <laughs> I would be in Brazil. Ooh. My baby brother, Brooker. I'd gotten caught on his way out and we lost him too. He was an incredible writer. Deja was on the West Coast when the country began to degenerate and escaped to Brazil with her partner. I have not spoken to her since the internet went dark. I know she's still alive. Ah, uh, I would be in uh, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Your sibling is there, yeah? I am where I want to be. Mm. I want to be right on this land with a thousand babies <laughs> running about, giving me a headache. Yeah, yeah. You see how this Desmond's the fixation is is it set on on legacy, huh? I see. And you? Where would you be? I don't know. Well, decide now. <laughs> if not, yeah. Where would you be, Kofi? Like a vacation destination. Anywhere, anywhere. Jamaica. Yeah. Jamaica man, the Ghana man cousin. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Yasa? Where would you be? <coughs> Me? Mm. I will be in Liberia. You can be in Liberia now, Yasa. It's right here. Yasa buries herself. They smoke in silence for a while. Nike and Desmond hold each other close. Muna and Kofi exchange looks. Daoud watches Yata closely. I have an answer. Where would you be? Thinking. Mm. He looks at Yata. Desmond gets up and changes the music to an Afrobeat set. They migrate to the parlor. Muna and her African waistline take stage. As she moves, the group watches, mesmerized. Hey, hey, hey. Uh -uh. Shame on Kofi and his negligence. Kofi watches Muna longingly. Yata starts to move with Muna in conversation with her. Yemi joins in. The Nike and her dress do. They make a show of it. The quality of their movements are indigenous. They're all loose and giggly. Linda demands Mamadou, who obliges. 
Daoud makes his way to Yatta. This morphs into a more abstract daze of euphoric hey. movement. Daoud or Mamadou play the horn big, maybe saxophone. Nas watches from a corner. I look over and find Nas watching us, Piki behind the wall. I don't call out for him to go. I think it's good for him to see us in passion and in pleasure. I want that for him one day too. The horn plays on. Wide open windows let a warm breeze pass through. They shine of sweat. In Desmond's <laughs> arms, I become a little wiser. Because while he does a heavy lifting by keeping me off my feet, I am free to dream. I stop for a moment and watch it all like a film. All my anxieties about the old world and fears of the new world are suspended briefly. There is a drumbeat swelling. It grows more and more sophisticated. One of the twins have taken a djembe drum that was used as a side table. The attention of the room swings towards the kitchen. Yata and Linda appear with a chocolate cake. Candlelight. Happy happy birthday. You are turning birthday. 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 <laughs> Scene four, they all sit about the parlor, the thick of a serious conversation, what might sound like an argument, something antagonizing plays by Miles Davis, maybe bitches brew. There was no way to avoid it. It was bigger than us. We've been here this whole time. Even in 2020, I had said it. I even posted it online. If I could show it to you, I would. I said there would be a new world order. And then five years later, the Congo go free. It was coming. And as much as it hurt, the fires reset the climate crisis, and we all watched the earth heal significantly with our own eyes. If I not see it with my own eyes, I no go believe. Okay, that's the thing about Africans, huh? Our yelling and screaming isn't anything to be concerned about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when we speak softly on topics of passion, then you must worry. Mm -hmm. uh, it's miraculous. It truly is. And I am grateful, honestly, every day. But I often wonder, why? Why was I chosen to make it? You and not another soul. Hmm? What makes me so special? And why? With so much beauty must we endure so much pain? Does it ever drive you mad? Huh? Mm -hmm. Oh, it drives me mad. I'm mad. <laughs> I'm mad. I wasn't mad when I got here. I grew mad. I could have handled this alone. Losing my person, leaving my home, being building from scratch. But to do it with mom? This baby who is, who is admittedly smarter than I am. <laughs> to survive for not just me, but for us? To give him some chance at good, I, I don't know. I have grown mad. If I didn't have Nas, I would have been, I would have, I would have been left. A screeching sound begins to roar and slowly builds. You've never felt that. Nas runs out of the back to his mother, book in hand. Mom. The floor begins to shake. Linda. Linda. She doesn't. She 
you could never. It's okay, please. Don't pay me. But I can imagine. I'm sure. Don't mind me. Stop! <laughs> Linda embraces Nas. The sound increases, they grow concerned, triggered even. The art on the wall shakes, some shatter even. Yata shrieks, Daoud gets closer to her. From the mouth of Abbas comes a spirit figure, grand in front of them all. All the noise ceases. Nas steps forward despite Linda trying to hold him back. End of play. Hello, hello. Rao Yao was laying on the floor. Hello.
Zawiya was laying on the sofa in her very funny apartment. And I was laying in front of her. It was probably a few weeks before she leaves to the U.S. She looked at me and she said, Do you know what is it that I will remember the most about, I will miss the most when I go to the U.S.? I will miss the sun entering my home. Whatever, man, I answered. I can't say I wasn't disappointed. Less than a year prior to this conversation, I had moved to Lebanon. Raudia was one of the reasons why I did it. I was starting to have a relationship with my sister, and now she was leaving. I can't blame her for escaping a sinking ship, but to say that what she would miss the most was the sun and not me made me cry a little inside. It's good in many ways that Rawia left. Her work as an artist had gotten her in trouble with the law. Beirut had given her many punches. This was Rawia Will Miss the Sun by Rita Mahoney. The road to success in a neoliberal paradise or what's left from the pastoral romance. Unpleasantness is when a single sesame seed is stuck between my gum and my tooth. If my gum inflates, I will have to cut my wrist one more time this semester. If I release the congestion, maybe the acid in my stomach will neutralize. Za'atar will make you smart. My grandmother said, Zatar will feed your brain. My mother said as she mixed the powder with the olive oil pressed from the hundred year old trees in our village. Eat before you go to school. I ate Zatar every day that year. The pavements of my city looked cleaner and none of us dared to rest our heads on the ground anymore. The street lights competed with the sun in midday. Coffee shops and restaurants released delicious fragrances of meats and sweets. The acid kept burning my throat. I lost my voice. I did not pass my class. I will stay in the same grade one more year and wait for the sesame seed to grow a tree in my mouth. I'm going now to attempt to call a friend in Lebanon. Her name is Ahlam. Lebanon is seven hours ahead of us. Uh, I don't know if she's on the phone. So. Hello, Ahlam, Marhaba, Ahlam, I am just on the phone to make sure you can hear me. Here in a world around me, there is no way to change the world. But that's it, I am on the phone to make sure you can hear me. احكيكي بعدين اوكي؟ باي لا مش هي مش حواعيكي باي ما 
Dahlia will have to lock her door in New York. By Ashlam. Before leaving Beirut for good, Dahlia spent a lot of time with us in the neighborhood coffee shop. In October, the sun was still shining bright, and a lot of us were out of work. So we spent our days chit-chatting and chain-smoking in the coffee shop. One day, while we were talking about how dangerous New York was, at least that's what we were told in the movies and on the news, Gabby recommended that Dahlia be vigilant. She should always remember to lock her doors in the evening. As if here, we kept our doors wide open, Rawia answered sarcastically. So, I told her the story of Hanif, my aunt, who was an activist during the Civil War. After putting her children to bed and before she went to sleep, my aunt Hania would unlock her door and crack open the curtain. Her reason was that if militia men came to assassinate them, they will find the door open and they won't need to break in and startle the children on their way to their mission. The children will die peacefully in their beds. About poets by the good mothers I left behind. Poets might spit in the face of the sun and the door left open will close on their noses, tragic seekers, they do not hear sounds when they sleep. They grind their teeth in silence. Only dust on blank pages and angry lines. A few letters and ink stains. They offered their tongues to the wind. It blew away and came back with more dust for their eyes. Doors and walls populate their kingdom. Open doors, broken walls, and children hiding underground. Remember that a good mother leaves the door always wide open when her children are asleep. The Habits Rawia Left in Beirut by Omar. On our way to the airport, Rawia informed me that she was about to smoke her last cigarette. I assume. Dawia started smoking very early in her life. In Lebanon, everyone who knew Dawia saw her at one point or another smoking a cigarette. When we arrived to the airport, we stacked our luggage on the cars. And before we entered the building, Dawia lit the last cigarette. explained to me that she had a revelation in a dream. Traveling meant leaving most of what she cared about behind. Her mother, her brother, her uncles, her friends, the Mediterranean Sea, the village down south and the olive trees, Beirut, and all the familiar places she knew in it. If she could leave all those behind, surely she could leave some toxic habits too. She wanted to quit smoking and judging people. Daria smoked her last cigarette down to the filter and threw it on the ground. And we stepped through the airport gate.
old habits die in a new country. The season of my youth opened the door and pushed me out. I emerged from the landing light as a fall rose petal, sliding on the breeze. The scars left around my neck by the fury of my pubescent years shone up light and coagulated blood. The pain on the tip of my fingers subsided. The wound where the nails used to be began to heal and my milk teeth grew anew. Is it time yet to rest my flag and fold my bed into a boat? I long to lay on a riverbed surrounded by flies and friendly cockroaches, caressing my tender meat to climax. For thousands of years, I have roamed these lands, and yet I keep returning to the same old mill to grind my bones and mix the potion necessary for the spell. And every time I tried opening my lips, mud and worms came out. All the planets conspired to keep me on the ground, and here I was again and again and again and again, knocking at the door of the mill, asking for what was left from the bones I had ground the last time, for no more pieces of myself will grace the altar, no more. Now, only the whole will walk. Now I'm going to try to call Stephanie. Stephanie is in Melbourne. So there's a, a very small chance of her answering because. So we'll see how it happens. going to give up because Melbourne is a very difficult one. The Uprising from Far by Sassine. Shortly after Rawia left the country, everything went to shit. The economy collapsed and the banks took all our money. People took to the streets. The demands varied between socio-economical reforms and aid packages. But everyone was united in Hungary against a system and the political class that had been failing us since the Civil War. Rawia was absent from the streets, but she was with us in spirit. This was not the first uprising she witnesses from afar, the Arab Spring turned into fall on her computer screen. This time around, she was still hopeful. From her apartment in Brooklyn, she had the TV on, a, on Lebanese channels while she was texting from her phone and posting from her computer all day. She even had a couple of posts go viral. And her name was mentioned in the streets quite a few times. Her spirit was with us. But I know for sure that she would have loved to be smelling that gas and kicking back those cans. A deserter's plea. Experiencing silence after a small war-like bliss, I looked in the mirroring eyes of my friend and said, I will never leave this land in pain and struggle. Stand your ground. Hold my back. Keep breathing out against toxic clouds. Poisonous rivers cannot defile souls. Angry Beirut keeps us safe, for here nothing can hurt our bodies more than ourselves. 
the cell keeps us safe. Like Medusas, hiding in the palace, fearing the wrath of men, let us all cross the imaginary line. Together, we will prevail together, I said. Do you see the future? I see in the coffee cup of bitter tar, more sunrises on balconies, fresh breezes by the sea, and fresh figs from the trees. I see, I see, I see, and the hand I was its held became a suitcase, and the balconies and the breeze and the fig trees became memories of mirrors and smiles and friendly sounds. Today, I caress strange pavements for tenderness. I walk in the heart of another city, deserter missing the war I just left. Will you hold me like the walls of my city once did? The explosion of August 4th by Deja. I was still dazed in the aftermath of the explosion when I saw Raulia's number on my telephone screen. I answered. My voice was shaking more than ever I even expected. She was out of her head. A friend sent her a message about the explosion in, in the port of Beirut. I began to comfort her and myself while I was looking around to estimate the damages. I concluded that it was limited to a few glass windows, which made me feel a little bit better. My son, Rida, is leaving the country tomorrow to begin a new life in Berlin. And I don't want, want him to delay his trip to help me with the repairs. I can take care of a few windows by myself. The images and videos of the explosion started to irritate me. Raulia said that she will call me later and hung up. She wanted to call and check up on her friend who lived close to the port. The next day, I started receiving messages and links from people to videos on social media of Raulia protesting in New York at the Lebanese Fountain. I know that my daughter is not an angel. But never in my life I have heard her utter these terrible, terrible words. For every politician, she had a profanity. And some of these images were very vivid. She made it clear nothing was sacred. On that same day, I drove my son to the airport. He looked devastated, and I was at my last breath. My four kids had all left the country, seeking a better life. And each one of them lived in a different country. My new home flickers. Steal it with a click. I like you. Click. I love you like an eternal meme. Click, click. I saw it the first time and ignored the message. I swiped and went about my day was filled with click. Click, 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 the war in Syria. Click, a TED talk on power poses. Click, click, the Southern's dead children of Palestine. And click, Grimes talking about the benefits of patriarchy. Click, click, I love your dress, your shoes, and the size of your boobs. And click, malaria is an ancient god of death devouring only the poor in Africa. And click, 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 click. The USA loves a good traitor. They round up all the murderers and bring them home to feed on the milk of the mothers here. Click, children in the cobalt mines of Congo, supporting their families with one dollar a day. Click, click, click. The god of the click sells your data to your worst enemy and sends you to war without an armor. Click again. 
and the beautiful color of spring or was it fall? Click on the picture and follow the thread who owns the right to my existence now. I click, click and click. On the edge of a cliff, I saw a body floating between the endless sky and the rock bottom. Is it me or the friend I was supposed to call? And click. Every passing moment brings with it the potential of a click. Words are senseless, flickering cursors suspended between the screen and the empty eyes of the beholder. Time and space are illusory. I have never left. I was never there. I am still here. My finger is so powerful. But why do I feel so resentful? I will leave the window of my bedroom open tonight. Maybe the breeze will bring silver noon. Raouya decided she was a New Yorker now. By Brian. I met Raouya shortly after she moved to Bay Ridge through a common friend. We are both theater maker and share an interest in the theater of the oppressed. A little more than a year after she arrived, the city went under a lockdown because of the pandemic. Suddenly, we found ourselves stuck in our apartments while others completely deserted the city. We kept passing by each other's windows to check on one another. When summer came, Raouya couldn't contain herself inside the apartment anymore. She started helping with the mutual aid program, filling her car with boxes and going around the neighborhood, distributing them. Soon after she began organizing picnics and games in Prospect Park and at the beach, she made big batches of tabbouleh and brought a bottle of ara to each of these events. She refers to this duo as her community potion. I don't necessarily believe in magic, but her spell did work. She made money. On September 15, 2022, she organized a big gathering of the park for her birthday. I was there. I was talking to her and I said, you seem to have settled well. She answered me laughing. I am a New Yorker now. After all, this experience expedited my transition into the city. While a lot of New Yorkers chose to leave, we, the immigrants, had no choice but to hold our ground and keep serving the city. It should be worth something. Sewing spells. The punctured lips opened sound manifested in the void. And Blow the sun. The meaning of the words unfolded from a drop of blood stuck between the canine and the lateral end. Blow, sun, and come back to me and you. Come back to the hole in my guts. Fill me with light. Offer my appendix to the moon and blow all sun. The corpses paving the road to the ball cannot shut their mouths. Stop. I once stripped on the fringe of that same dress. Was it in your nightmare or mine? And blow the light of day. Cover their moving heads. Cover their faces. Cover their insides. Spit the sand from your mouth. Stop and blow the fire. A vision unwinds between the letters under a blanket of meaning. Lies an opaque word of sense. Stop. 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 And repeat. Suck the pain out and spit and swallow the breath and repeat. Spit, swallow, repeat until the lungs that speak meaning fall into pieces and become the seeds that sprout in this peculiar ground. I'm now going to attempt to call my mother who is visiting my sister in France because my sister had a kid. It's my mother, she's going to answer. Oh. 
دورو ايه كيفك حبيبة منيحة يا عيوني انت نايمة؟ لا بعدك ما اختلفتش بعدك اختلفتي؟ بعدك انت غريبة؟ لا ايه بس هيك عم بتطمن عليك يعني ربي انت كيف كان العرض اليوم؟ بعده شغال العرض انا عم بحكيك من العرض والله؟ ايه سلمي لي على اللي عم بيشوفوكي بتسلم عليكم <تصفيق> طيب يا رورو انا بحكيكي بعدين <تصفيق> اي حياتي موفقه صباح على خير لاف يو باي وانت من اهله ذا جولد كوين باي رجاء تو ماي ديستريس راويا ديد نوت هاف ا ويدنج بارتي وين شي جوت ميريد فروم لبنان اند ناو شي از ليفينج ذا كونتري So I decided to throw her a goodbye party four days before she leaves. Say what you want about me, but I am known for presenting people with the most elegant of gifts, and it was time for these people to return these gifts. Everyone came to the party, and most of them brought small gifts of gold, necklaces, bracelets, and golden coins. I gathered everything in a small jewelry bag and gave it to her. I hope that my daughter will have many jewels to her name, but until then, and in case anything goes wrong, she can always use the golden coin to pay her bills. Becoming the water that keeps us apart. Are you the devil? An ocean wave asked while forcing me back to shore. My left eyebrow rose above my forehead. An eternity passed. Stuck between the tides, time never made sense anyway. Only motion spoke in rhythms and rhymes and blazes. I am important, I spat. My tears supply the ocean with salt and keep humans from drowning in the abyss that bears you. Let me pass. Let me go back to where I came from. I want to feel the weightlessness of being the same. But you are the devil, and to the shore I was thrust again. And so what? What if I was Satan? What if I was the mother that beget the slimy cold skin? The disappointed father waiting in the corner of a dimly lit living room? What if I failed and kept failing? What if I can hug you and let go? What if you swallowed me this time? And instead of a car, you made me into a car. The Kind Killer, a solo show by Achiro P.O. Watch, read by Janet Kilongwa. 
Nata is the main character. She's a 45-year-old woman who carries anger, rage, and moves through multi-layered emotions in the piece. Production notes. The actor speaks to the audience like a traditional storyteller would talk to people seated around a fire. The use of drums and traditional music and traditional harp called ananga is the music played to emphasize the storytelling. The actor moves from making peanut butter to nursing her baby all the while telling the story. The story is based on the war in Northern Uganda that lasted 20 plus years and ended in 2006. I sat in a small dilapidated latrine clutching my small child. He is now eight years old, but he was two at the time. Can you imagine a two year old sitting still in a confined space for a whole day? I was pregnant with this child, he is now four. Each time I was so worried that at any one time the latrine would collapse. And I asked me why I was there in a broken down latrine with a small child. Because you see, this was the only place that was safe for me and my child. We used to play this game called, we used to play the cat chases a mouse. Kappa, egoba, mese. Kappa means cat, mese is mouse, egoba means to chase. Kappa, egoba, goba, kappa, egoba, mese. Kappa, egoba, goba, kappa, egoba, mese. Now I was always the cat, the kappa. And the others were the mese. Oh, I like to chase the children around because I was so very fast, so I caught them too, all the time. It was so easy. Some of them ran as if their feet were stuck to the ground. And those were the good times. My older child, Kilama, never got to be the cat or the mouse. He grew up never knowing joy. There was no playing, no chasing other children. Even the other children could not play. There was no kappa, and there definitely was no messe. Even this one, he knows no joy. My husband was cut down right before my eyes. Kilama saw blood and heard screams. He was two at the time, but he learned to never cry because he was afraid people would hear him and come for him. He had seen other crying children disappear. He was just a baby and that was his life. That is what I think about each time. Now, let me tell you the story from the very beginning. One bright morning, when the sun had just woken up, there was a knock at the door, and I went to open it. It was our shamba boy, Kabalata, standing there. I had been watching cartoons with my little son. Well, to be honest, I was the one watching. My son was asleep on my lap. And my husband was seated with his laptop, typing away like the world was about to end. In a way, I guess it did for him. When I opened the door, what I saw, Kabbalata held a machete in his hand. The machete was bloody. There was drops of, the bl of blood on the doormat. Th that was all I could see at the time. I looked up for a second, and that's when I saw behind him people were running about like headless chickens. Kabbalata stood in the way trying to block me. He didn't want me to see. Why didn't he want me to see? He did not want me to see what he had done. And then he smiled. The devil smiled at me in the middle of all that mayhem. I love OD. OD is what you would call peanut butter. We would call it ground nut paste, as you must call it in English. We do not. We never do. Why would we? It is OD. Now, this is the beginning of the making of OD. You clean the ground nuts. Well, the beginning is buying the ground nuts, or if you are very hardworking, harvesting it from your garden, shelling it, and then drying it in the sun. And then you fry it on a hot fire till the ground nuts are cooked. Now, you make sure not to burn them, or the OD will become bitter. Now, when they're ready, you allow them to cool before you clean and sort it like I am doing now. There was so much chaos and screaming and death. I was so confused. I cannot believe I had not heard this earlier. Would you believe that Kabbalata just stood there? He just stood there motionless and emotionless as if he was unaware of what was happening around him. Now I looked back down at the machete that he was holding. As fate would have it, my son came behind me and he started to cry. <laughs> How I missed the sound of his cry. I do not know if he was crying because he was hungry or he had seen Kabbalata's bloody machete. 
And Kabbalata motioned to the child and put his finger to his mouth. Silence, he was saying. I stepped back and I picked up my son. I had never seen Kabbalata look this stern before. He had always been a smiling man. And he was often very polite and respectful. He was very hardworking and he always kept our compound and our hedges very neat and clean. He used to cut the trees and the hedges into animal sh shapes. Yes, he was a good shamba boy and he made me very proud to own such a neat and beautiful compound. Yes, here I am praising him and giving him a reference as if you would ever want him to work on your hedges. Hedges. Maybe that is where he learned how to use a machete. Kabbalata entered the house, slowly wielding his bloody machete. My husband, George, stood up from his chair and he walked up to Kabbalata. And George said nothing. It was as if he already knew what was going to happen. He gestured for me to leave the room with the child. As I walked away, I saw him look at Kabbalata in the eye as if he was daring him to do something. That was the last time I saw my husband standing and alive. Kabbalata killed my husband. He cut him down in cold blood. Then he came to the room where I was hiding and I noticed that he had tears in his eyes. Kabbalata had tears in his eyes. Why? Why would he have tears in his eyes? I am asking you, why would he have tears in his eyes? What was he? Was he mourning what he had done? No one knows. But his tears did not matter. I do not care. I was terrified. All I saw was his machete, and it was dripping with fresh blood, blood that I knew was from my husband. And Kabbalata just stood there, tears, a bloody machete, screaming everywhere, but not in my house. And right at that moment, there was such, such a silence, such a cold feeling. It was like somebody was rubbing an ice block all over my body. Even my child would not cry. He tried to, but all that came out was a muffled sound. He, it was as if the sound had gotten stuck in his throat on the way out. There was nothing but silence. Nothing but a deathly silence. Kabbalata took me and my son to live in his house at the edge of the village. He hid us in the outdoor latrine during the day and in the night he would collect us under the shadow of the night and hide us in his house. Well, it was not really a house, it was more like a hut actually, a mud hut with a grass thatched roof. Remember I told you he was our shamba boy, yes? A myth, a choli people love OD. We eat OD with everything. We eat it in the morning with cassava and tea. We can use it with any sauce for lunch and supper. Now that is what, that is if you eat both of the meals. You know, you can put it in lakorokoro, malakwang, or bo. Oh, I love it best in malakwang. With malakwang, I can eat it with layata, the very sweet, sweet potato. Ooh, mayana, that is real food. My husband, used to like OD with dried meat. Then he would ask for rice, then I would have to cook a whole kilo. He would not stop eating. Oh. But there was no making or eating OD in the bush with Kabbalata. You know Kabbalata, the man who said was our shamba boy? He used to come and cut the grass around our compound. Now I was at his mercy. I lived in his hut and slept on a mat on the cold, muddy floor, and I hid away in his latrine during the day. Saying the tables had been turned is an understatement. I did ask him once why he took my husband and left me and my child. He said that he had to have proved that he had worked that day. Work. That is what they call the killings, the, the massacres, work. They equated it to clearing a shamba, cutting away at weeds, weasels, weeds, rats. That is what they called us, just because we belonged to another political group. You see, my husband worked for the government. That meant he was their enemy. Why did Kabbalata save me? Why didn't he cut me down too? They met in his hut, the killers. They met in Kabbalata's hut. 
And there were so many. Sometimes there were too many to gather in his hut, so they sat under the mango tree in his compound. I could hear each and every word they spoke. You see, the latrine was right behind the mango tree. It was an old broken down latrine. No one used it anymore. That's why it was the safest place for me to hide. It was smelly and full of all the flies in the world, but it was safe. It was either live in filth or die like a dog. Some days, I did think it would have been better to die. Better to die than watch my child sit and be covered with flies amidst the stench and all that filth. Kabbalah says that he spared me because he loved me. <laughs> he killed my husband and spared me because he loved me. Am I supposed to feel lucky or fortunate? I should have let him kill me too. I should have let him end my life, but my child Kilama, now I have two. Now this is the second one. Kabbalata made me his wife. I was a beauty queen once, the, the pride of Gulu. Now, now I have a bastard child of a rebel, a mere shamba boy. Oh, how the tables have turned on me. This war, this war tore this city apart. It waged on for too long. The rebels wanted to break off northern Uganda from the rest of the country. They wanted to call it the Northern Republic. These same men who were killing their own people wanted to rule the same people that they were killing. Can you imagine that happening? The rebels, they met under the tree to count how many more people they had to cut down, how many more weasels they, they had to kill in that day. They talked about people like they were talking about sewer rats. We were their friends, their family, their own people. We all spoke the same language, but somehow we had become the weasels. They walked around the whole village, one house after another, cutting people down as if they were cutting papyrus trees. Man, woman, or child, they did not care. As long as you were not with them, you fell at their feet with a slice of machete. They are the ones who were the weasels. They were the ones who were killing their fellow men in the name of liberation. What were they liberating? Who were they liberating? We were just in a village far away from the state house in Kampala. How is it that we were to blame for the bad governance of our country? How are we to blame when there was no safe drinking water in our houses? Were we God? They called us weasels. They, they are the ones who are the weasels. That is the child of a weasel, a real weasel, not me. I have not even named him yet. I do not know what to call him. What name should I give him that will let him know how much I, that will not let him know how much I hate him, that he was not planned for? What am I supposed to tell him when he grows older? That I was raped into submission by his father? That his father killed the love of my life? I met George, my husband, when I had just been crowned Miss Tourism in Northern Uganda. I was 19 years old and the gem of the North. Now George was a young doctor, fresh from the university. He was the son of the mayor of Gulu. George was tall, dark and handsome, a typical Acholi man, the pride of his father and the pride of our land. And he chose me. We were a power couple, very beautiful to look at, and every other person's envy. Now, you think Beyonce is usually a power couple? <laughs> Ask people. Ask people about Atim and George of Gulu. Ask them. They will tell you about real icons. And still, being an icon made no difference to those weasels. They came like a flood, the ones that you do not see coming. One minute we were watching cartoons, and the next my George was no more. Now, I am watching over the child of a rebel. I let Kabbalata have me every time he wanted. That was the only way that I could guarantee that my child, my only child, George's child, would stay alive. 
Kilama is the only thing I have that reminds me of George. The only thing that gives me hope and makes me want to continue li living. Now you must think I'm a very heartless person. My mother used to say that all children are a gift from God. <laughs> God. Where was he when my husband was being killed by a Shango boy? Where was God when I was being raped every day? Is this some kind of cruel joke that this old so-called God is playing on me? Is he punishing me for being beautiful? That child, this child will never be my child. It will just be one of those ones that are found by the dustbin. I cannot even leave him at the mission or the hospital, no. If I could, I would kill him as he slept. I would. You can call me heartless if you like. Call me a self-centered bitch. I do not care. If you want, you can take him and raise him as your own. But then again, I want to keep him. I want him to remind me of where he came from. I need him to remind me that I need to keep living for that George's death was not in vain. Maybe I should call him George. He came from my body, so in a way, he is my child, I suppose. Kabalata is dead now. He took me and my son to a clearing and left us there. The army was going to bomb the rebel settlement where we were, and Kabalata, he went back there. He went back so that he could die with his fellow Vizu, the other rebels. He left me and my children in the clearing. He said that we would be safe. The army found us there. It was just me, my children, and a young handicapped rebel called Pinto. They brought, us, they brought us here, and now they're asking me all these questions, making me talk about my life, making me tell all the stories that I want to forget. Do you have any idea what it feels like to relive a past that you want to forget? Do you know what it feels like to stand naked in front of a stranger and let them judge you? Let them decide whether you are telling the truth or not. The years went by while we were in the bush, the rest of the world carrying on like we were not a part of them. Now that's how I learned the proverb that says, each time two elephants fight, the grass beneath them is the one that feels the pain. My whole family is dead now. I live with my two sons in a small hut at the end of the village. Nobody wants me around. I am afraid to sleep at night because I worry that the rebels will come and pick us up again. I cannot tell anyone what I am feeling because people do not want to hear these stories. Sometimes I think that people are still afraid that we are still rebels. And in a way, I now understand Kabbalata a little bit. These men, they do not know why they were fighting. They were forced to fight. I am tired and I want to go home. Please tell them I need to go home. I do not even want to eat my OD anymore. I'm not hungry now. Telling these stories just takes away my ap appetite. I told you that we cannot make OD in the camp. No, we cannot. The camps are six by six huts and they were so close together, you heard everyone's business. Now you ask why the children who grew up in the camps know bad manners? How could they not when they heard the neighbor's business or if they were unlucky, so grown ups, parents or not, doing these things in those small huts? These children of today, they know too much. Do you hear that small girls are pregnant at 10? Yes, 10 years old, raped by their brothers and uncles, some even as young as nine. These camps were not a place to eat OD. Rehabilitation, <laughs> that's what they call this center. They call it a rehabilitation center. They are going to rehabilitate us before they allow us to go and live with the other people in the camps. Being former rebels and rebels' wives, this makes us unfit to mingle back into society. I am tired. 
I have told my story a thousand times. Did you know that even people from outside countries come to the center? They come to look at us and talk to us as if we were a tourist attraction. They come with a big camera so they can take pictures of the rebel wives. How does talking to me help you? Do you think it helps me? My case worker says that talking helps. Helps who? Every day I talk until the saliva in my mouth gets finished. All this talk has done for me is replay the horror over and over again until I do not feel anymore. I do not feel anything anymore. Maybe that is what they mean by help us. Help us not to have feelings. Now this OD is nice and the right consistency, the way it should be. Maybe later I will be able to eat it. Now OD cannot be wasted and thrown away just like that, appetite or not. There were other women in the bush. They were not women actually, they were young girls, all of them made wives. Some of them as young as 10. The rebels did not like old women. They saw no need for older women. Those were the ones they raped and killed or left them to be destroyed by, destroyed by any other man. Now, would you imagine that at 22, I was the oldest wife in the bush? I became like the fairy godmother for all the young girls, the ones that they looked at as having all the answers. They asked me what to do to make it stop hurting. Do not fight. That was all I could say. Now, I was not a virgin when Kabbalatu got me, but it hurt worse than my first time with George. It felt like my intestines were going to come out of my mouth. So what was I going to tell these young girls? That their pain would stop someday? No. Do not fight. That is all I could say. Just let them take your innocence like an animal. I sat the other day with Mina Dong. She was with me in the bush, but she got rescued much earlier. She was telling me to stand for woman member of parliament of Gulu. Now she's a current woman counselor for Omoro County. <laughs> me, a whole MP. She says, just because I knew Gulu before the war, then I experienced the war so I know what women went through and I can speak for them in the parliament and say what they need. I could never be a member of parliament, not in this government. Why you ask? I will tell you why. Odi is a dish to be eaten when you are happy. It can only be made when you have food to mix it with. When there is no food, what use is Odi? Where do you get the money for the groundnuts when you live in the camps? Where do you get the energy to pound and grind Odi if you have not eaten for days? There was no eating Odi in the camps. The camps, that is where we were taken and kept as prisoners here in our country. Prisoners in our own country, exiled in our own country, unable to go to our homes and till our land. No, I cannot become an MP in this government, never. This is the same government that sat by and did nothing for 20 years. Did I tell you? that the war in Northern Uganda raged on for 20 years. Yes, 20 years and they did nothing. I watched the years pass me by and as they did nothing, now I should become a member of parliament to help them govern my people, to make change. What change? Will the change heal this land? Will the change heal the pain that I feel? Will the change bring back my husband? Maybe politics is just not for me. What then do I want? I do not know. Right now, it is as if my head is full of porridge and I could just not think properly. Maybe what I would like is for my children to grow up without pain in this world. Is that possible? 
I want them to be able to laugh and cry and play. I want them to be able to forget the bloodshed that they have seen. That is what I want. Do I need to be a member of parliament for that? I am tired. They say I'm lucky. Lucky, that is the word that they used. Lucky, they say, because Kabbalata took me to that clearing. They say that he was kind. <laughs> kind enough to let me live, even when he knew about the airstrikes that were about to take place. Kind. That is the word that they used to describe him. It is a good thing I did not die in that bush. What would have been the point of stepping over my dead husband and hiding in the latrine if it was going to end in a bush? I want justice. Kabbalata and some of his fellow rebels were killed in an airstrike. These people told me this news perhaps, hoping that I would be happy. I want justice for people like me and my whole family. Maybe for some people news that their oppressor is dead is enough, but that's not enough justice for me and all that I have lost. There's also the Mato Oput ceremony they do here in my tribe. Have you heard of Mato Oput? No? Okay, let me tell you about it. The rare process and ceremony of Mato Oput is undertaken only in the, rare ca in the case of intentional or accidental killing of an individual. Now in this case, all the killings by the rebels were very intentional. The ceremony involves two clans bringing together the perpetrator and the victim in a quest for restoring social harmony. Mato Oput begins by separating the affected clans, mediation to establish the truth, and payment of compensation according to bylaws. The final ritual, drinking the bitter root, is another day-long ceremony involving symbolic acts designed to reunite the family. Then, there is what they call the beating of the stick. <laughs> and no, it is not what the saying suggests. I wish it was. Oh, I would have loved to beat those men the way that they beat us. <laughs> the beating of the stick is followed by the sacrifice and exchange of a sheep by both parties. Now, if you do not have a sheep, you go out and you buy one. People with sheep became rich during Mato Oput. It was good business, good business indeed. The final stage of the ceremony is the mixing of the bitter Oput root with Kwete, our local brew, and blood from the sheep. The mixture is to be drunk by both parties as a symbol of washing away bitterness and eating of the liver to restore good relations. The ceremony is ended with a celebration of restored relationships. Restored relationships. Matoput is not for me. Pinto requested to do Matoput and the families of the victims refused. That is why he lives by himself at the edge of the village. <sighs> Tomorrow is another day. I need to rest now. I have to check that my son, Kilama, has had something to eat. Maybe I will even cook malakwang and wayata. You are welcome to share if you want. Just come around and if I have cooked, I will give you some small small. If I have not, at least you can drink some water and sit with me. Miladong might have passed by my hut and then you can meet her too. Ayabe of Woyomatek.
fall by Francis Bensom. At Rise, a backyard, early September, Ma sits in a wheelchair, Rose in nurse's scrubs. Ah, very bad day, huh? We never have this in Haiti. Beautiful autumn leaves. Can you repeat after me? Rouge, marron, jaune. <coughs> oh, oh, tu es froid, maman? Yeah. Ticado from me to you. Then she don't speak that language, you know. Yes, I know, but she can learn. Learn. <laughs> she don't even know what fucking day it is, and you want to teach her some Creole mess? This is not Creole. It's French. Excuse me. It can stimulate her brain her senses, like music. It makes her happy. N'est-ce pas, maman? Tu aimes comme j'ai pas le français. Hey, lights a cigarette. <laughs> Lord of mercy. You should not smoke those things around her, eh? You should not smoke those things at all, but it is a free country. I know it's a free country. I'm American. And this is my home, so I will smoke wherever and whenever I fucking please. You people are so... What was that? Do you have this kind of language in front of her? Where do you think I learned it from? Tell her, Ma. Tell Miss Rose here how you like to cuss like a goddamn fucking demon straight from hell. Huh. Oh. See? He likes it. You like it when I cuss, don't you, Ma? Shit, shit, shit. Damn, damn, damn. Shit, enough. Shit. Well, well. Sorry. I'm very sorry. I, I knew you had a little something in there. I do not mean to raise my voice, but... No, you're not perfect. Nobody is. Bet if you cussed every now and then, you wouldn't lose your temper so easy. Who says? Hey, lights another cigarette. You complain about my French, but that foul language is very toxic. Like the smoke. Look. Before I call you out your name, let me just remind you that you work for me. If you got a problem with that, I can call up the agency right now and have them send someone else, understood? Or do you need me to translate? Oh yes, of course. It is your house, your body, and she is your mother. Sadly, we cannot choose our family. Emma, mom. <laughs> she likes it. <coughs> Ça va? Uh, maybe I will take her inside uh, and let you... No, no. She should get some sun. <clears throat> Trying to cut down anyway. Shit is killing me. Your mother here or back home? She is in Haiti. Haiti is not home. Not for a long time. How long is long? More than 10 years. That long? <laughs> where you talk, I just assumed you fresh off the boat. In the way you talk, I assume you are just out of prison. 
<laughs> I'll let you have that one. I will take it. I'm going to get her juice. Can you watch my own mother? Yeah, I think I can handle it. Thank you. Rose exits into house. Tay watches Ma stare up at the trees. She tentatively moves towards her. It seems as if she wants to reach out, put a hand on her shoulder or something. It changes her mind. Rose enters the suite. Et voila! Mama, here is your... Or would you like to do it? Child, please. That's what I'm paying you for, ain't it? Of course. Here you are, my love. Oh, what was it for? Let me help you. Open your mouth. Bless you, mama. Why do you call her that? What? She's not your mama. It is an expression. You call all your patients mama? Of course not. <laughs> But, uh, I don't know. I, I like your mother. She is so sweet. The way she smile at me, laugh with me. She remind me of my grandma. I know she was a good mother to you. I can tell. That what you think. I know. I'm always right about people. I have a gift. Oh, yeah? Wait, you the kind that be having candles and charms and bones in your back shit? Be killing chickens and shit? You are so fucking ignorant. Whoa, you hear that, ma? Now we talking French. <laughs> what are you doing? I said I want her to get some sun. And I want to take her inside because I don't want her to hear what I'm going to say to you. Oh, she's heard it all, believe me. And it can't be worse than anything she said herself. Still, I would prefer to take her in. Hey! I said, leave her. Whoa! 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 All right, then. What you got to say? I'm listening. You are the most rude, mm -hmm. foul mouthed, mm -hmm. disrespectful, awful person I have ever worked for. And that include the old bitch who called me her girl and would check my bag before I leave her house. Or the pig whose filthy house always smell like urine no matter how much I clean. And every dirty old man asking me for a massage with happy ending. You are worse than all of them combined. That it? You want to know why? Please. Because mm -hmm. at least they care for their family. They may have been racist, dirty, perverted, but when it came to their family, there was love. There was tenderness, respect. It is the only reason I tolerate their nonsense. But you... You don't know shit about me. I never see you touch her. You don't even sit with her unless it's to smoke, curse, and show me over and over again how truly ignorant you are. Oh, I'm not the ignorant one. You've been in my house for half a hot minute and you think you know anything about the two of us? I know what I see. You see what you want to see. I see what is, and I tell it like it is. And what I see is a bitter woman with a superiority complex who wasn't good enough to be a real nurse and thinks she's too good to be a maid, so she settled for a job in this with a three and a half star agency. And to make herself feel better, she turns her nose down at the people she's supposed to be helping and caring for. If I did not care about your mother more than you care about your mother, oh, you care I would have more out than a me? long time ago. But I fear what will happen if I leave this poor woman, oh, woman in your care. At least my mother is here with me, not left behind in some piss-poor, pathetic-ass country. Ooh, 
people did. You people are better than oh, us. But you are solo class. And you the one changing sheets and cooking grits. You think you have the right to disrespect me? Your ass been in this country a hot minute. Probably ain't even got to not know what I sacrificed to be here. I have three degrees from Haiti, Canada, America. And I got my own office with my name on the door. I work for me. And matter of fact, you work for me. Choose to do this work because of people like you. Oh. Treating your poor mother like a If it wasn't and for me, this poor woman that they would have been no on the streets they years they ago. Love. You think I don't care? Oh, let me tell you what this poor woman did in her life. What a type of woman she is. What type of mother she is. What kind of hell she put My me through. My mother wanted to be here with me. I would take her no hesitation. No matter what. Good for you. If I could take back all the mistakes I made to have my mother with me, I would. But sometimes you don't have the chance to make things right. Well, I yes, guess you're just a bitter. special yes, kind of bitter. Because you get to be with your mother every day. And you take it for granted. Because well, if you are this so poor woman up up her, hey, she would smack the French right out your mouth. Well, she called you a dirty ass Haitian bitch. Oh. Oh, Mama, ça va? Stop speaking to her in French, damn it! Oh, oh, oh Mama! Oh, okay. oh! Okay, I have never seen her like this. Maybe I, I should. Uh, uh, move. I got this. Oh. Oh. What is it, Mama? Oh. What you need? Oh. It's me, Ma. It's Tay Tay. You got a cold? You you want? Whoa! Whoa! What? What? Whoa! Whoa! Say, say, Mama. Rose notices a beautiful fallen leaf. She picks it up and hands it to Ma. Ma settles down. Oui, maman. Good. Bravo. Très bien. Bonjour. Bonjour. Ah, damn. Now she can't even speak English. Come on, ma. Let's go back inside. Mm. I know, I, I know, I'm going to get you something to eat. Mm. She wants you to turn her around. I didn't ask you. Mm. She wants to look at the leaves. Ma, we're not doing that right now. Ooh. Ma. Mm. Yes. Leave her. I don't need your help. But mm. she wants to. I don't. don't. Huh? No. Oh, oh. C'est sauvage, hein? Such a nice woman. You don't behave this way. Eh? Say. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Rose turns to Ma to face the trees. She looks up in delight. Tay and Rose watch her in silence. Hey. Hey. Oui. Really like looking at them damn leaves. <laughs> très, très jolie. She said, they're beautiful. <laughs> Unbelievable. Turn her back into a goddamn ignorant, goddamn immigrant. Back? Mm, she's not from here. We're not from here. Born in Jamaica. You? 
I would never. We shed that skin a long time ago. That's what she wanted. I told you, you don't know anything about her. All you see is a sick old lady. No. I see my mother. But she is not my mother. And, well, some things you cannot take back. You should call the agency. Call the agency and have them send someone else. I, I can stay for the day if you like. Wash her sheets, make her dinner, and... Uh... I just washed her sheets. They're still in the dryer. Oh. Well, I will... Why don't you start dinner? I can make a bed. I, uh... I got that, uh, that squash you were talking about. Coyote? Make that. Can you please make that thing you made last week? She liked it. Legume? Yeah. She liked it a lot. She likes you, so... And I, I got nothing against Haitians. I was just. Of course. I mean it. I don't want you thinking. No, does it matter what I think? Well, I just wanted you to know I, I'm not. I wasn't the one with the problem. And who was? She's not some kind of angel. She was never weak, never soft, never warm. She was the cold one. Cold, rough, and hard. And she hated people like you, your kind, she would say. She hated all kinds of people. <laughs> hated me most of all. You know very well that is not so. Never told me she loved me. Never said much of anything to me except order me around. Didn't take much for her to put her hands on me. I remember this one time. This one time she pulled the hair right out my scalp. Dragged me so hard across the carpet it changed color. Could never look down at that carpet again without see my own shadow screaming across that room. That's the kind of woman she was. Not this. People change, do they? Or do they just get tired? Maybe both. But it does not make you tired to be so angry so many years later. You're right. I did not know your mother then. But I know what it is to be in a new place, a new country alone. I assume alone. Alone with a child? I came here with two alone. And all those years alone, I did my best. But I know if you ask my kids, they will tell you I was cold, hard, and, and rough. And I was. I was hard and rough and scared. And I did things I regret. My man, my mother, she was like this too. And, and we fought. The older I got, the more angry I was. And even when I could see she was changing, I did not want to let the anger go. When I left Haiti, I told her I never want to see her again and swore I would never be like her. I broke her heart. I have tried so many times to make it right, but 
some things you cannot take back. And of course, I was just like her. Maybe you can't tell now, but believe me, I was hard and rough and cold. I believe you. In Haiti, in so many of our countries, the women have to fight, eh? Fight so hard just for basic things. Light, water, to, to keep a job, maybe two or three, sometimes more. Fight to come to this country and then fight to stay in this country. So as long as there is a roof, food to eat, clothes on our back, what more do we need? Maybe if she did not have to keep her hands ready to fight, she would have been able to use them to love you. We do the best we can. Eh? This is what I tell my kids. They say, okay, everything is fine, but I look at them and I see the anger. And I pray it doesn't destroy them. Bonjour, Mama. Do you mind if I go on? You know, I, I call her Mama because most of the time, all the time, she calls me Teyana. Tete, she sings. You are all that she sees, all she remembers. She loves you. Isn't that right, Mama? You love Tete, eh? Bonjour, Tete. <sighs> That's just great. Wait a moment. No, Mama. That is Tete. Here. No, no, she wants to touch your face. Gentle. Hmm? Hey, bent down. Ma takes her head in her hands, laughs. <laughs> she kisses Hey right on the lips. <laughs> That was different. <laughs> take her hand. She wants you to take her hand. Bouge. Bouge. She wants you to repeat. She wants to teach you the colors. Bouge. End of play.
Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a quick five minute break and then we're going to transition into the young Ukrainian playwrights group. So quick five minute break. Thank you. person will stand.
Okay. Sorry, Kathy, I think, I think you're on that one. Can I move? Can I move this? I have it on the side with a little star. You know what I mean? We will now have our readings by the Young Playwrights Ukraine Project. This is curated and run by Laura Cahill. First up, we will have, um, these are five short plays. First is Perfect Material by Taya Fedorenko. Next is The Odd Couple by Luka Ivanov. Then we have Too Close by Uliana Klimchuk. And then Runes by Sasha Sarita and Boom by Karita, Karina Sirota. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Um, I'm Laura Cahill. I'm the artistic director of Young Playwrights Ukraine, and this is our running order. Um, first up, we have Boom by Karina Sirota, uh, Too Close by Uliana Klimchuk, The Old Couple by Luka Ivanov, Perfect Material by Taya Fedorenko, and Ruins by Sasha Sarada. Thank you. Boom by Karina Sirota. Woman, played by Sarah Stiles. Scared, played by Kelly O'Coin. Funny played by Catherine Curtin, angry, played by Deja North. Scene one, scared. February 24th, 2022, 6 a.m. The start of the war in Ukraine. The morning people woke up to explosions. Woman, lost, stunned, wandering. Scared, a complete stranger, following her. Did somebody say something? Boom. 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 Is it important? Like, what is going on? <laughs> Can I just wake up and, and go to work like I do every day, just casually? Where is my coffee? Air raid alert, proceed to the nearest shelter. Um, no, seriously, I have an important meeting today. Should I be scared? Should you? You have no choice. Wait, I need to explain. No, 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 no time. You can explain whatever you want later. But my meeting, I'm going to be late. Right, late? You're afraid to be late? For work? W-O-R-K? I have to catch the bus, B-U-S, bus to work. The last one will be in 15 minutes. Hard case, hard case. I'll take the number 23 bus that will arrive on time. Nothing is going to ruin this day. <laughs> what can possibly happen? The end of the world? <laughs> this is going to be an amazing day, just like usual. I'm going to wear my favorite skirt, the blue one I bought two weeks ago. I'm going to stop for my favorite croissant with chicken and no tomatoes on it. I hate tomatoes. They can actually ruin my day. A and I've been preparing for this meeting for a week. I'll answer the questions correctly. I I'll know all the, the correct answers. Everything will go as planned, minute after minute. I know the answers. I can hear the birds sing on their way back home. I have to get dressed can for work. you hear me? Hello? Here I am. I can hear explosions that no there must be some mistake <laughs> you're not real go away thank you for reaching out to me we have received your message and we will be in touch with you if you want to make an appointment press one okay, if you want to listen listen 
If you want to have your amazing day, then have it. I'm out. Just don't forget to cover your ears so you can live in illusions. In a world where everything is perfect, a world where it's not been like five minutes ago, a full-scale invasion of your country. I'm just trying to help. I'm trying to make it as hard as possible for you to think so you will remember everything as sound, as a horrible dream. You know what, miss, I need my meeting to go well. You don't care about yourself. Think about the people you love. My parents, another town, uh, my friend, online, my neighbor across the street. D do I have to scream? Run? Uh, should, I, should I pack? Where the hell are all of my documents? Finally, step number two, scream. Yeah. Run! Uh, do we have enough time? Who should I call in a situation like this? Mom? Uh, 40-year-old woman and still waiting for advice from her mom? Look, grab all necessary Boom! Grab all necessary things. All unnecessary things. There's no time to think. Uh, but you have to remember everything. Faster. Instinct. Freeze. Unfreeze. Uh, Wake up. Wake up. Explosions near the Harkiv airport. Is it too far away for you? Okay, wait, how about this? In Dnipro, a residential building was destroyed by a Russian missile. Russian missile destroyed houses in your childhood district. Russian missile destroyed your childhood. No childhood anymore. There is no childhood anymore. Oh, is it still too far for you? Explosion, right now. In your neighbor's house? Running, I'm running. My home, running. Brushing my teeth first. Uh, putting soup in the fridge. Ew, it sounds like Putin. I'm never saying Putin again. Uh, grab, grab, safe, survive, grab. Ski glasses, uh, towel, uh, no, no, tomato sauce for pasta. Jewelry, uh, books, two extremely heavy books, uh, th three underpants, warm sweatshirt, light t-shirt, one more underpants. So, so uh, how, uh, we're packing for what, a day? 10 years, 20 years? You will never be able to return home again. Poor kid. Scene two, history. Woman and scared on a train. Woman holds a huge textbook in her lap. No water, no charger, no plan, no money, no one around, no home, no place for you. You are a stranger, alone, alone, alone on a train. They taught you this in school with all these numbers, dates. In, s in seventh grade, all of this were raw facts and you, you never thought that it could happen to you. You were just mad that you had to memorize all this. History for seventh grade? You think it'll never happen to you. You think it's not possible and you reject any little or small possibility of this happening. I'm scared. When my grandmother, my, my mom's side, was telling me stories about World War II. All of her stories were like a movie, something that happened in the past and would never happen in the future. Every time my grandmother was telling me these stories, I couldn't understand how she remembers everything that happens so long ago, every number of every date and time. I'm scared. You never thought that you'd be inside of this, inside of the history book for seventh grade, inside of the story that you would tell your grandkids. I'm scared. I understand. I remember. I will remember. I will never forget. <laughs> Scene three. Funny. Lights are brighter now. Woman and funny face each other. Scared stands near woman. What is so funny? Ah. Hey, there, there is nothing to laugh about. War is not funny. Oh, so you're all alone, right? <clears throat> yeah, I'm not alone. Thanks for reminding me of that. Oh, why? why? Why would you take, like, that with you? Okay. Ring, 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 ring. Notification. Nipro, explosions continue. Where the fuck is my phone? Ugh, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Oh, how are your parents? Your childhood friend, that, that nice lady who was smiling to you on the way home from work. How are you? How are they? How? Where is my phone? Your phone is not charged. End. End. You don't have a charger. <laughs> That's funny. Shut up. How dare you? It's not appropriate for you to be here. And there is no place to sleep for you. <laughs> oh, oh, for both of you. Ha ha. They say laughing helps. Well, it's not helpful at all. You're alone, no phone, no charger, no smiling, no laughing. Do you have new information? You know, I haven't been here long, and I've already memorized everything you're saying. 
Yeah, she's alone. We get it. And apparently, she can't smile. <laughs> Things that made me smile disappeared that morning. It's been three days or four. She can't smile. How? What is the point? Cover your ears. Oh, well, why are we covering our ears? I don't know. Just listen to me. I'm scared. You need me. It's all so heavy when you are around. I was just trying to help. Let me breathe. Go away. Go. Say it. Yes. What will you do? Because I'm alone in another country, I guess I'll sleep on the streets with my pasta sauce. Oh. Tomato pasta sauce. It's not me, it's my life. I have no plans. I don't know what to do. Is that so funny? I, at least you have three pairs of underpants. Oh, four, oh, sorry. Oh, oh you have four. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a little bit easier with you. Everything seems like not such a big deal. You gotta cope with everything that's happened. Everything happened so fast. There, there was no room to think. I'm abroad now, not in my apartment, in an empty room. One fork, one glass, one mattress on the floor. Where do I start? Oh, 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 wait, oh, wait. You smell her ooh. That was a close question. <laughs> what? I think. Where? Ooh, oh, oh it's, it's far. It's far away. Ah, you soup. <laughs> you see soup in the fridge. Actually, I think there is no more soup and a lot of new organisms in there. I mean, wh what were you thinking? Oh, finally. <laughs> if I'm not there, then the life organisms in my soup can look out from my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the crickets are tiny little legs. They can clean up all the mess you left behind when <laughs> you were packing that away. Yeah, you're right. Maybe they can actually come here to clean all the mess I have in my head. <laughs> yeah, I need right. yeah, to go out to work. You put it in the file. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and all mess cleaned up. It's a simple equation. You laugh, you live. You know, it, I help you. You're alone. Whatever. <laughs> you'll go back home soon, you know, and, and now you'll find your people here. You're a stranger. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, there are people here are ready to help. <laughs> <laughs> Scene four. Angry. A dark street. Angry slowly approaches. Oh! What are you doing? Where did Bunny go? Robbers, pickpockets, murderers. Oh! Oh, what is that sound? Is it a motorcycle? Because if it is, I would gladly get an Uber. Because of this ugly, nasty, stupid, fucking, disgusting. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Fucking yes, fucking yes, I understood, but fucking who? Fucking stupid, arrogant, small person, not even a person. It's a thing. Yeah. I know. War can have a huge influence on your mind. Uh, but, but remember, go out in the world. Put a smile on and voila. A uh, simple equation. Well, you, you are a refugee. Your life turned upside down. Do you remember how nice it was to spend time with your family and friends? In one second, they changed the lives of millions of people. Because of what? They want to get richer? They want our land? Who could be so rude and so stupid? They are. They are. If not for them, I could just live my life. I could have the privilege to just enjoy my fucking life. To not check the news every second. They put everyone's life on pause. <laughs> well, it's a good thing that none of them are here right now. Because I could not hold in my emotions. I would give them this stupid chair. So nice of you. What would you do next? <laughs> I, would, I would give them this chair and my stupid ski glasses. It will be all that they get for the rest of their life. They left me with nothing. At least I'm giving them stupid ski glasses. <laughs> yeah, what would, what, would, what would they say? Uh, what would I eat? Nothing. Oh my God, what will I do with no house? And it's too late at night. Nothing. Do, do I have to wear the same thing every day? Ew, what about my clothes? Nothing. 
Nothing? Nothing! Good night, mate. Back up! Whoa, she's thin. <laughs> oh, how I wish I had just been late for I work. I wish we could switch places. Oh, good joke, good joke. It's good not joke. a joke. You're here. I promised you. I promised you I'd stay. And I will. The others will come and go, but I'm scared. And I will always be with you now. And the flesh. Too Close by Ulyana Klimchuk. Risha, Russian volunteer, 19, played by Misha Brooks. Masha, Ukrainian refugee, 18, played by Julia Caldwell. The front seat of a car on a dark highway in Bulgaria, heading for the border, days after the war began in Ukraine. It's the middle of the night. Risha drives and Masha sits in the passenger seat. And my girlfriend is an actress. We both want to start a yard. It's two in the morning, and I've known this boy for a day. Do you know I, I play cello? Actually, right when the war broke out, I was playing in a concert. It, it must have been really tough to stay focused yeah, and play. Exactly, it was. Look at the, uh, look at the pictures. Oh, you look nice. Do you have a video? My mom has one, I, I think. She's always recording me. She's an actress, you know? Really? So talent runs in your blood. When we lived in Moscow, she worked in the theater. It's two in the morning. I've known this boy for a day, and he's from Moscow. Why'd you move to Bulgaria? Oh, my mom despises the Russian government. She always said she didn't want her children to grow up and build their future in that awful country. She had a point. Doubtless. What does your girlfriend think of you driving with some strange girl in the middle of the night to the border to pick up a few more strangers? She's cool. Yeah, my, my girl's awesome, you know? <laughs> uh, your parents? What do they think? They don't really know I'm driving to the border right now. They think I'm at Nina's. That's my girl. They don't know? We're doing this to help people, right? So my parents wouldn't really be against it if they found out, but I'm not going to tell them. Do your parents know? Yes. Everyone knows exactly where I am. Uh, the woman we're picking up has her 89-year-old grandmother with her. Can you imagine? That's so old. It must have been so 
exhausting and overwhelming to make that trip in the middle of the year. She's literally fleeing for her life when she's 89. She survived World War II and now this. How do you think she feels right now? Ask them how far from the border they are now. We won't be there till about 3.30 in the morning. Um, now she's saying there's a woman with a child in another car on their way to the border behind them, and they need us too. So, four more people? And they need to get to Burke. It's two more hours of driving and then back to Varna. We'll be driving all night. We have to figure out if we have enough space for all of them. It's not just seats. What about suitcases? Let's just figure it out when we get there. I don't want to give them hope that we'll be able to drive them to Burgess and at the very last minute refuse to take them. Listen, there's nothing we can do. It's enough that we're driving in the middle of the night to pick people up. We can't help everyone. But, but we're kind of volunteers. We have to. They left their homes, and now they're coming to another country where people don't even understand the language that they speak, and they have no idea if they're ever going back home again. We have to take them. We're doing it. Can you hand me that energy drink that's on the back seat? I haven't slept in a while, probably over 36 hours. I could really need more energy. It's two in the morning. I have known this boy for a day. He is from Moscow, and he hasn't slept in more than 36 hours. He plays cello, though. Should I open it? Yes, please. Tell me, uh, isn't it boring to live in Varna? Seems sort of boring here when it's not summer and no one's coming to the Black Sea, especially after Moscow. Moscow's big. I think Varna is too small. <laughs> Kiev is the capital. It's just hard to be in Varna in the winter. It's really fun in Varna, if you know what to look for. Me and my friends have so many fun stories. I once had a near-death experience. No way. Yeah. My girl's ex brought his pals to kick the shit out of me. They all looked like bouncers. Oh, no. They waited for me on the street the whole day. I was filled with adrenaline the whole time. I can imagine. Look around. We've been driving for three hours. There's no light, no cities, nothing. Yet this car... Has been driving behind us for half an hour now. It's too close. And they don't overtake us even though the road is deserted. You see that? She looks back and sees the lights of another car driving incredibly close behind them. For half an hour? And they've been right behind us all the time? Yeah. I noticed them a while ago. I saw a movie like that. And I believe it didn't end well. Don't worry. There's a bag on the back seat. Get it? Now, uh, pull out the gun. Wait, what? You have a gun in the car? <laughs> it's 2.30 in the morning. I've known this boy for a day. He is from Moscow, hasn't slept in more than 36 hours, plays cello, and carries a gun. Yeah, sure. I, I got it after the fight with those morons. All my friends have guns. I actually, I want to get another one because of the war. Who knows when you're going to have to defend yourself. She pulls the gun out of the bag. Um, uh, what, what should I do? Uh, hold, hold it? Give it, give it hey, to you? What's the calm point? down. We'll, we'll just see what happens. Masha nervously holds her phone in one hand and the gun in another hand. He puts on his turn signal and pumps the brakes. Hand me the gun. She does. They both watch, only moving their eyes, as the car that was following them finally passes. See, it's all right. No need to worry. Maybe he was just using our aerodynamics. Doubtless. It's three in the morning. I have known this boy for a day. He is from Moscow, hasn't slept in more than 36 hours, plays cello, and I just handed him a gun. End of play.
The Old Couple by Luka Ivanov, Lyubov, played by Julie Boyd, Vitali, played by Dylan Baker, Germany, present, Lyubov sits on a bench in a park. I recently met a man right here on this bench from Gag Dagestan, a real dignified man, and more than dignified, he was remarkable, so accomplished. He told me a story about how he got in a terrible accident. His car got caught and he was dragged four kilometers. Four kilometers, you understand? Horrendous. He went to a doctor. He took some pills. They just drowned him in medicine. Nothing helped. It seemed like it was, that was it. It's over. And then they gave him barley. All he needed was to swallow a little bit of garlic and he was fine, even better than before. Of course, his leg never grew back, but what's important is that he was active again and had a new lease on life. He even told me, since I have my health, <laughs> what health? Three strokes. Do you understand what three strokes does to you? Because they've brought me, brought me to such a state. The tennis ball flies on stage. Luba, see it here, huh? Lubachka, huh? send the ball back, huh? Get out of here jumping around. Why should he jump around me? What is this? How could this happen? I've traveled all over the world to every country a guide would suggest. The softest beds hotels could offer. I couldn't tell you how many beds. And now, three strokes later, I sit on a bench with nothing to do. I made money. I did radio electronics. You know how important radio electronics are? They're such small components, and yet they connect entire countries. Vitaly picks up the ball and sits on the bench. What is this? What is this? Done enough jumping? My back started to hurt. You've jumped around your whole life. What do you mean my whole life? I, I started playing tennis when I retired. You jumped while I raised the kids. Don't talk such nonsense. Nonsense? My life with you. That's nonsense. I married you. That's no life. Stifling, stifling, hands strangling everything. I'm Already. Like a dog barking alone. You're a dog. You drove me into a cage. Oh, and what cage is that? Germany. Is anywhere good enough for you? We can live here. Our home is gone. Oh, my neighbors, my lovely neighbors. Oh, Leza, such a good friend to everyone in the courtyard. What courtyard? None of them are left except Toma. Toma died. Just because you haven't seen her in a while doesn't mean she's dead. She was so fat. She couldn't even walk. How could she have survived? You used to call Katusha a shameless whore. Stop talking nonsense. Uh, Why would I ever call her that? I don't think she deserved it. But you insisted she was a shameless whore. Well, she is our neighbor. Neighbors help each other. Why would she charge money for medicine? Because she needs to live on something. Did you ever help her with anything? Of course. She lived off the decency of her neighbors. You seem not to not remember the day her apartment flooded and we all helped her clean it. But that was you who flooded it in the first place. When you fell asleep in the bathtub. I'll get back. I know it. Until then, I'm going home.
I hope I die. I mean, not only in Spain, but in Germany. <laughs> I want to die here under pleasant circumstances, though. I don't need a monument. I just should be here. I do want to live, but I'm scared of living long enough to have to go back. Well, there'll be some law, who knows, because it's better just to die. And if there's some old folks home here, oh, you can even say life's good. My wife doesn't like it here. She's bored. She looks out the window for days, even though she spent the last year we were in Ukraine doing the same thing. I'll tell you a secret. She's never traveled to any foreign country, only some ex-Soviet republic. And she's never done any radio electronics. Yes, we studied together at a polytechnic institute. And later, we both had jobs on the assembly line at an electronic factory. But we were just regular workers, not engineers. And she wants to make up stories and believe them. Vitaly puts down the tennis racket. He reaches into his jacket and retrieves a small bottle of vodka. He unscrews the cap and goes to take a drink, then stops himself. Oh, I didn't drink before the war began. Well, I can't. <laughs> I did drink. I drank a lot. But then I quit. Decided enough was enough. Didn't have a drop of alcohol for 15 years, but <laughs> it's calling me again, enchanting me. I can't explain why I want to drink again. When I was young, I would drink with my friends because we had no responsibilities. We only wanted to have as much fun as possible. Then I got married. I stopped because suddenly I had responsibilities. And I, I didn't want to embarrass myself in front of Lubotshka. Then I became comfortable with Lubotshka, and I went back to the merry life of drinking. Then we had our son. Again, responsibilities. I did work a lot. I developed a routine. Not long after, we had our daughter. Oh, I started. <laughs> I, I, she was really the final straw. She broke my bad habits. I even started going to church. Thank God our children have grown up. Thank God they've given us grandchildren. Danilov and I bought a dacha, and then I decided to be myself again. My retirement was going well. You have to understand, I started like before without excess thoughts without tension. The point isn't the drinking, but the state of your soul, the state of, of harmony, abundance. No, no, not even abundance, serenity. But then Liuba's health got worse, one stroke after another. So I started attending church again. I became a, a church member. The first time in life I'm a member of something. I don't know how to feel about it. On one hand, I'm proud to be an official member of the Baptist church, but on the other hand... Vitaly hides the bottle from the boss. I got the keys. Uh, Vitaly gives her the keys. Don't get comfortable. We have church soon. In three hours. But then there's the commute. It'll take us 40 minutes. With two transfers? Only one transfer. Oh, I've had enough of you. As Lubov leaves, Vitaly takes out the bottle. Here in Germany, we have no responsibilities. Lubov has a church, and I have my freedom. Yes, her health is, is getting worse, but Germany is not such a bad place if, when your health starts getting worse. She keeps saying, let's leave. I've had enough of Germany. I've had enough of you. Where's my community? Where are all my neighbors? He reveals a plastic cup, fills it with vodka, and takes a drink.
Vitaly pours some more drinks again. Yes, I've had enough of almost everything. God knows. Vitaly stashes the bottle inside his jacket. End of play. <laughs> Perfect Material by Taya Fedorenko, Laya, played by Taya Fedorenko, Ivan played by Kelly O'Foyne. A basement in a house in Kyiv during airstrike, a year or two after the war began. Ivan wears a military uniform. There's a camera set up between them. Are you ready? Again, I don't want to make you uncomfortable, so the questions will be light. And obviously we can stop at any time, and I promise I won't be upset. Yes. All right, I'll start recording. Okay. Ready? Okay, okay, fine. Here we go. She demands to heavily push a button on the camera. It's on. So when you were in... The loud sound of plane flying somewhere above. The sound lasts a few seconds and then disappears gradually. Sh sorry, we'll have to start again. Fucking asshole. What was the question? Okay, ready? Yes. Okay. So when you were, you know... In the trenches. Is that what they were, trenches? Just ask me a question. Right, right. I will. Give me a second. I don't have all day. I know. Could you please move a little to the right? No, no, my right. A little more. A little more. Could you go back a little bit? Perfect. All right. Here we go. What is the worst thing you've seen? Oh, seriously? No, no. Serious? I, I have to call your mother. She probably already knows that the sirens are on and she's freaking out. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I won't ask you dumb questions. Okay? Please stay. This is actually important to me, okay? No. Thank you. Did you kill people? No, 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 Dad, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Dad! Yes. Yes, what? Yes, I killed people. No, 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 never mind. I didn't, I didn't kill people. I exterminated the enemy. 
We simply can't think of them as people because they're not, not to me, not after what I've seen in this detail. People are not capable of doing the things that those animals did to that town. And you should know, your cousin was there. You know what she's like now? You think there's any way to fix something like that? I say, yes. I killed them. But they're the ones who came here to murder, to torture, to rape. My job is to prevent that, to defend. I know, Dad. I shouldn't ask soldiers questions like that. I'm sorry. I just thought it would be easier after you came back from there. There? I thought we could go back to the way it used to be. Like, before the war, before you made Mom and Zoya go to Poland and didn't let me come home. Your mom and your sister are better off in Poland. Yeah, right. Dad, I literally came all the way here just so we can do this interview. I really need this for my documentary. Like, you're the perfect material. You're in therapy, right? You said it helped. You even apologized for having been a bad father these past few years. Not that you're bad. Of course not. I just thought... Language. Sorry, I just thought you'd be normal. I'm sorry, what did you just say to me? You have changed so much. Ever since the war started, you stopped paying attention to me. And mom, and I know we're far away, but it's not our fault you didn't leave when you still had the wait, chance. Wait, wait, are, are you saying that I'm selfish? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's not my fault. You're different now, okay? Nothing different about me. You just, you just forgot what I'm really like. You don't even respond to my text, Dad. Ever. The only time you called me was when Nick and I broke up, and you know what you said? Wait, who's Nick again? Get over it. Like, seriously? I get it. You're a guy. Whatever. You're my dad, too. Where's the, I'll beat him up. Oh, Where's, no. he's going to regret and this. And how am I going to beat him up if, I'm, if he's in America and I'm here? It's not the point. I... I promise to answer your questions, okay? Are you happy now? No, I'm not happy. Why, this, this, this documentary, how is it going to help us? How is it going to help Ukraine? People will watch it and see what it's like when your country's at war, and they'll donate and stuff? Do you know what it's like? What? Do you know what it's like when your country is at war? What is it like? No, tell me. Was it so difficult for you to sit in film school in New York that, by the way, I paid for? What else did you expect me to was do? Was it hard that? to watch videos of bombings on the internet and post about it on your Instagram? You were the one who told me to leave. Yeah, well, you certainly made sure to run far away from me, far away as you could. I didn't know the war would start when I was leaving. I didn't know there would be a fucking war. You miss it when I was so sick. I miss it when we used to talk about something other than this. I was 18 when the war started. I'm 20 now. Do you miss me? Ever. Of course I miss you, Dad. <laughs> you know what I miss the most? times when you asked me to drive you to school, <laughs> you told me to play the most audacious rap I have ever heard in my life, and you knew every single word, you'd belt out those songs the whole way to school and make me sing along, I really fucking miss that, Dad, I, I, just, I just, uh, you know, still still listen to them sometimes, the songs. 
What's the difference between me and you? You talk a good one, but you don't know what you're supposed to do. I act on what I feel and never deal with emotions. I'm used to living big dog style and straight coasting. <laughs> Damn. Nothing different about me. Well, what is it? I hardly remember myself. I was like 13. I don't really remember right, anything. Right, 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 right. And I think we filmed enough. Time to wrap it up. What? We barely time started. Time to turn off the camera, Lia. Come on, Jack. Lia, turn off the fucking camera. She reaches for the camera. They fight for it until the camera breaks. Shh. He falls on the ground to pick up camera. He tries to fix it, but only make it work. Okay, I'll, I'll fix it. A buddy of mine does this kind of stuff all the time. He can fix anything. Microwaves, fridges, all, all kinds of things. He'll take his tools. Um, oh, I have some tools in the kitchen. I'll, uh, it'll look just like that me. Is broken? No, 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 no. It's not. Then it, you can't fix not. it now. It's not broken. Daddy. Look at it. Why don't you look at it? Back? It's all right. I'm tired of doing You don't need a new one. I'm tired of the old one is still good. You don't home. need to replace it. Why didn't you take There's me no back? There's no need to replace it. Please, don't buy a new one. I'll, I'll fix it. I promise. Off. I'll make I'm it as good as new. I'm tired of being like this. Why didn't you, you take will, me you back? You will like it so much. I, I promise. I'll fix, every, I'll fix anything I want you want. Home, I will fix it. the fucking camera! Same bitch. Okay. End of play. Ruins by Sasha Sereda. Girl before, 17. Played by Bryn Gautier. Girl now, 18. Played by Taya Fedorenko. A childhood bedroom in ruins. A year after the war begun. Why are you here? I wanted to see for myself. Everything's in ruins. Do you even recognize this place? Of course. Did you know I'd be here? No. Why aren't you looking at me? I, I just wasn't prepared, you know, to see you, to see you here. Are you happy to see me? Are you happy to see me? I don't know. Am I not pretty? I just wasn't prepared, okay, to see you here. I've been here the whole time. I didn't know. It's been almost 15 months since we left. Where were you? What was it like? Do you have a boyfriend? Have you been going to parties? Oh, I bet you have. Tell me, where, where, what are you like now? Are, are you a traitor? What? You ran away. I got scared. You ran away. Everyone was scared. There was a choice. You crossed the border. You are a traitor now. I was here a week. All right, I couldn't handle that game of battleship. Watching as all the buildings around were half ruined and only this one remained undamaged. Yeah. I'm a weakling. I packed my things and ran away, and so far away. I was leaving, and the world was burning, burning, burning. I, I hated myself. I was ashamed for running in front of everyone. Even the gas station attendant who always asked us to leave on 20 grivnas for tea, he saw me. Yes, I'm a coward, but I'm not a traitor. You're not a coward. Why are you wearing that skirt? 
You always said you looked like a grandma in it. I like it now. My taste has changed. <coughs> I have changed. Don't say that. It makes me sad. Let me tell you a story. I love your stories. It's actually more of a confession. Did you kill someone? Just, just listen. Remember that time when we were choosing what to watch and I wanted to watch a movie instead of TV? You said that it wasn't like me. I always get crazy now when people say things like that, but this, I became obsessed with this. I became obsessed with this thought. I and just want to hear Let this. me finish. So every morning I wake up and I ask myself, is it like me to have pancakes instead of scrambled eggs for breakfast? Is it I wash dishes before the entire sink is full or is it I slowly turn into my mom? Think about it. People's tastes change every seven years. So you've overdone the omelet. Does that mean you're a different person now? Maybe. I don't know. Where did you end up? Have you been to Italy? Oh, God, I dream of Italy. And somewhere in another world where whoever you visit to a doctor or a hairdresser is a language test, where you rent an apartment with bare walls on a monthly basis, you need to buy everything when you buy it, but you don't hang the curtains because you're afraid to start decorating. I'm sorry. I already hate that thing. Me too. But you're safe here. Be at least thankful. I hate that my desire for safety has overtaken my desire to be home. Are you ever going to forgive me for leaving? Maybe. Someday. What destroyed the house? Cruise missile. It was a fragment. I've studied it all. Everything that happens back here at home. But you don't even live here. I've been here all alone through everything. I imagine things did. So now you're back. Are you scared? No. You know what you can do if you get scared. You can sing. Remember that song? I don't sing anymore. I can't imagine you not singing. I did at first and it didn't help me. I think I even forgot how. People handle war so differently. When I was in the basement, our neighbor, the house owner, remember her? Of course, is she still yeah, there? Yeah, just listen. Even her, who's lived here all this time, was asking me, what's flying now? I said, cruises. She was like, and what was flying yesterday? Ballistics. And which one is more dangerous? The ones yesterday. You know what she said? Oh, that's awesome. Everyone chooses which way is easier for them to accept this reality. She said she closed all the windows and now it doesn't matter. One's emotions leave and only the cold mind remains. We should go knock on her door. Maybe. I don't want to. Why don't you want to go knock on her door? You don't understand anything. I mean, you shouldn't have to. I'm the one who should have to. An airline. Let me see. Russian Mythical. Is it a fighter, right? Yeah, but don't worry. That's not a serious threat. If the takeoff is not combat, it'll be a short alarm about half an hour. They do that quite often just to give you nightmares. The plane takes off and all Ukraine turns red. And what if the flight is combat? Five minutes and the missile is here. Let's go and hide. It's not necessary, really. The plane will fly for a while and then land peacefully. I'm sure. I know all of this. I studied it. We don't have to be scared. You said the MiG isn't a serious threat. What is a serious threat, then? There's two main types of missiles, cruise missiles and ballistics. Cruise missiles can be guided in flight. They're given an exact target, so they fly directly there. The thing is that when they're knocked down in the air, the debris falls on the houses. Usually those attacks occur at night, so in the evening, telegram channels say whether there is activity of their carriers in Mordor, so it's possible to precalculate what time the alarm will be and when the missile will be here. When the alarm is sudden, 
it is most likely bullish decline. You have five, seven minutes to hide, that's nothing. No chance of getting down from the 18th floor to the shelter. Also, these mornings like to trigger false electronic signals. The alarm goes off, it shakes you, and then you peacefully continue to wash your dishes. It's impossible to live like this. You said you don't get emotional, but I refuse to believe it. I know you. I know how badly you're afraid of thunderstorms. You're lying. And all of those who say they're used to it are lying, too. Until we become a liar and a traitor. You're not a traitor. You said so. I'm sorry. I'm sorry this happened to you. Nothing happened to me. You used to live in a peaceful world. Full of dreams and hope. Your biggest loss was the death of Iron Man in the Endgame. And your biggest problem was how to pass the email with the highest score. I don't have that. We had a part of us back there. We knew it. But you found it quite interesting anyway. It was a kind of method to make up for a boring life. You had a precise plan for your school life. You had... They calculated everything. You were beautiful. Young and sweet, only 17, right? I think you're beautiful. You don't accept. I mean, the photos on my camera roll. I wish my phone had a feature. You scroll down your gallery. When you cross February 24th, 2022, you get a message scrolling further. It could be dangerous for your health. Stop. It's not like me. You're not like me. I'm not you anymore. Why? A murder was actually committed in this room. Who killed you? The morning of February 24th, 2022, they came to my house trying to kill me, but they missed and shot the wrong one. End of play. Thank you so much to all of our writers and performers and directors. We're going to quickly transition into a panel discussion. Um, so I'll, I'll invite our writers who are here and Laura, if you want to join. And then I believe we have some friends that are zooming in. Um, so we're going to go ahead and add them as well. So about two minutes and we'll jump in.
you can see. Yeah, we're waiting for one person to, to come in. Should we start? And then, China, will you come and um, just join them in when our final person comes to the Zoom? Okay, feel free to have a seat. Have a seat. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Can we give them another round of applause? It was so great. All our writers, directors, performers. We'll first start with doing a round of introductions. Can you hear us on the, the Zoom world? I don't know if you could do a reaction, a thumbs up. If you could say hello. Can we make sure we're unmuted, China? Can we hear Luca, Sasha, and that, that says Ulia. And Ulia, can you hear us? Yes, yes, very good. Hello, hello. We'll do a round of intros. Luca, can you hear us? Yay. And Ulia, is that right? Yes, Ulia. Can you hear us? Oh. oh, logging back in. And can you say something, Sasha, Luca, let's see if we can hear you on our end. I can hear you well. Yay, Luca. Yeah. Great. Hello, hello. All right, and it looks like we have Luya. We'll start in the room while um, she's logging in. Can we just do a round of introductions and can you tell us which play you wrote? Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Karina and I wrote Play Boom. Uh, and I'm from Kiev, Ukraine. I study here at Mayor's College, uh, so it's like two hours from here. Yeah, and I started playwriting two years ago with the help of Laura and these beautiful people. Thank you, <laughs> lovely. Um, hi, I'm Taya Fedorenko. I'm from Kiev, Ukraine, but I go to the new school and I study drama there right now. I wrote Perfect Material. Thank you. We can start at the top. I think Sasha. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Sasha Tereda and I wrote uh, Ruins. I'm from Kiev, Ukraine, but uh, currently I live in Germany. Thank you. And we'll go down to Luca. Hello, uh, my name is Luca Ivanov. I'm from Kiev. Uh, currently I'm in Vienna. I wrote uh, Old Castle. Thank you. And Ulia? Hi, my name is Uliana Klimchuk. I'm in Kiev right now. I'm from Kiev. I'm 20 years old and I wrote Too Close. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Such beautiful pieces. And then, Laura, I know you already introduced yourself. Can you um, just tell us a bit about who you are and how this group came together and why? In um, <clears throat> In, two, in, in 2021, I was teaching a Zoom class to teenage actors in Kyiv. Um, I was teaching uh, them to, um, to write a short screenplay. And when we were done, they were going to go off and make these screenplays. And instead, um, I think it was 18 days after our last uh, class, um, uh, that the war started. Mm. So we got back together on Zoom and uh, started writing plays together because the way theater is a response to war and uh, we grew. Um, Taya was one of my original uh, students uh, before the war started and then Karina um, came after and uh, we met, we just kept meeting every Saturday and Sunday and uh, 
writing phase and just writing and writing. And we did uh, uh, six months, July 24th was the six month anniversary of February 24th. And we did a Zoom reading with uh, where I brought professional actors in just to, to read all of their plays. And it just kept going from there. They have their plays done in Sweden. Their plays are being published by Smith and Krauss. We've done readings in Brooklyn. Last Monday night, we were at the Vineyard Theater um, reading seven plays. Um, and yeah, that's <laughs> wonderful. We uh -huh. had a mentorship project where um, we had a, a great playwrights um, from New York coming in um, on the weekends and, and working with the writers on, on their plays. And mm -hmm. um, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, a lot of times artists will write about um, things that have happened to them or conflict once they're on the other side of it. Can you all talk a bit about what it was like to write and create in the middle of it while it was happening and what some of the challenges and opportunities were to be writing in the middle of experiencing the war at the same time? Anybody can jump in. I remember it was at first it was so hard because um, I remember I was so excited because I never wrote a play before. I didn't even know how it works, how like what what is what how is to write a play. So, but I was really curious, and I remember at the beginning this group of people give gave me a hope, and I just every time we were on Zoom, it felt like we were together, even though we were like in different countries, different time zone. Dif everything is different. We we never met each other before, and those meetings were were really warm. So at first, it it gave me hope and gave me like warmth uh, at the beginning of the war. Um, but then I remember it was it was hard to write a play because I was just staring at the blank page on my computer, just like okay, what do, what do I do next? Um, but then. I realized I can't write anything else except war because it was happening with me, with my family, with my friends, with all people who were around me. So it was, um, I felt the need to tell a story, to tell my story, to tell a story of people who can't tell stories um, anymore because of the war. Um, and I lost my thought. Uh, <laughs> um, it's just, it was hard but it was really important for me and I couldn't think about anything else. So ever since war started, all of my plays were about war. Yeah, thank you. Um, for me, it was a little kind of the same, but also different because I found it incredibly nourishing to write while it was also happening because at this point, I do not remember the first probably six months of the war because of how difficult it was. And I'm so grateful I did write at that time because I would have forgotten all of those experiences and they would not never just find their way into a play. Um, but I do remember having this support system and having all of these people that are going through the same things that I was going through who also were struggling and still wanted to do something about it too put it into art, into something we love. And I agree with Karina that it was important for me to also write about my family because um, I was separated from my family at the beginning of the war. I was here when the war started and then I couldn't go back. So I wanted to write about my parents and about how their daily life was just happening. And it was just, incredible to have the opportunity to learn how to do that because I don't ever want to forget what it was like. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Would anybody in the Zoom world like to respond? Challenges of opportunities? Of what Taya said, I think for me writing was kind of a way to honoring people who weren't with me in the moment or people who sadly don't or not even people. I wrote a play about my dog and my dog is not with me anymore. But I feel like I've created something, like a piece of art where he will exist forever. And 
my dad wasn't with me for the first four months of war before I came back to Kyiv. And that's my cat. I felt I felt like I just need to write something about my dad to feel closer to him. So writing helped me feeling closer to my home, feeling closer to my family and people. Thank you. Wonderful. I really think that writing helped me to think of a way to feel more attached to the to my country while I was like abroad, and I felt responsible for telling the stories of um, people who can't right now because of it, and. Uh, it felt like un united. So everyone united, um, everyone in, in our country united, and we um, and we did like at least something that we can do great to help our country. And uh, I realized that right now I have the opportunity to write, so I will tell the stories because I believe that the words can can lead to actions. And it'll help my country. Thank you. You don't have to respond to this, Lisa. Um, Sasha kind of touched on this, but um, I'm wondering if while you were writing, if you were thinking about what you wanted the audiences to take away from your pieces, or did you just want to get it out? Like, what was the balance between thinking about what you wanted audience to know about you and about your country and about your people versus you just were also an artist creating? I could start that. Um, for me, it was more of honoring the people that I was writing about because um, at the beginning of the war, uh, both my parents decided to stay in Ukraine and help. So my dad went to the army the second day the war started. He volunteered and my mom stayed and volunteered to help civilians who were in the occupied areas and with food supplies and all that stuff. So I felt like as their daughter, I wanted to I wanted the world to know how proud I was of my parents. It's that simple, kind of, because I, they're my idols. I, they're, I'm proud of them. I love them, and I wanted that piece of them to be shown to the world. And I wanted everyone to know how brave they are. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. Well, <laughs> <that is okay>. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me. Um, I'm not sure because I feel like for m when I was writing my play, it was a collection of experiences. It was never about one story. I was just kind of like listening what people are saying, what people, um, because I, I'm a lot of my friends and family there are around the world. So m two years, it's been relationship on the phones mm -hmm. and I, I know. I haven't seen a lot of my close people um, in two years, uh, for two years. So, and when I was talking with them, I was just kind of collecting a lot of things that they were saying, and that's kind of how I wrote my plays. Um, I think it was a balance of what I want audience to feel and who I was writing about. Um, I just felt it was really important for me, for the whole world to see how ordinary people um, live through through war, and how what what's what happening in your brain and your head when this happens to you, when you're not expecting this to happen to you ever, but it happened, and how you go through all of this. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? And then we'll open to see if the audience has any questions. I think for me. One of my biggest fears in the beginning of the war was that people will forget, that the news will stop cover, covering the stories, um, people will stop talking about the war, and things like that. And granted, it happened. Two years later, you can say that nobody really talks about the war anymore. Um, it's 
in my world, in, in the world of my family. But even with my friends, we choose to talk about something else because war literally occupies my entire world. Um, so in the beginning of the war, it was very important for me to just write those stories, write simple stories, write something I experienced, my parents' experience, my friends' experience. And then even if I didn't get a chance in the very beginning to share them, Laura was incredibly helpful in sharing those stories with the world. Um, so thank you, Laura, again. Um, and I just, we as a group were incredibly lucky to find tools and find um, those ways out to share the stories with the world because there are so many and there is no way to tell all of them and there will never be a way to tell all of them. Um, but knowing that people, that people share this and knowing that people are aware of what's going on with simple people in Ukraine, um, and this is everyday life right now, this is everything that this, the stories that we share today, it, those are happening every single day in every household in Ukraine, in all the cities. Um, so it's important to know that those actually reach not just the audience, but maybe the audience will go back home and tell tell somebody else, this is what we've heard today. And maybe then somebody will see a Ukrainian on the street and just hug them and, I don't know, share love and try to help somehow. Not even just the Ukrainians, just to help each other as decent people. Yes, thank you. Yeah. And just following the question, um, it's hard for me to write about uh, other people, so I try to incorporate my personal experience into like universal story, so everyone can find themselves in it. And uh, I just feel that it's so important, uh, like to tell our stories um, that wide, so uh, people can feel like kind of empathy. And uh, so it can reach like the heart and it'll be remembered. And uh, that's important. So like Ola said, that can lead to other things too. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? And then I have one final question and we'll wrap up. No? Comment doesn't have to be a question or a comment. Everyone? Everyone? <laughs> Pastor. <laughs> well, um, okay. <laughs> Thank you. It's oh, so difficult. Uh, my name is Olga Levina. I was born in Ukraine. I'm um, executive producer of Jersey City Theater Center. I was born in Kiev and came here a long time ago. Well, 32 years ago. <laughs> um, and of course, it, your work is beautiful. And if I can help in any way uh, to, you know, you're absolutely right. Um, unfortunately, we have another war and another war. And it's just, we live in a horrible world today. And uh, any way I can help your voices to 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 give you voice i'm here for you um but you're very very talented i'm with you um in heart every day um and that's it what else can i say i don't know thank you thank anyone you. else there's one right there yep and then you Hi, I just wanted to say, um, as a young person who only got to experience what was a reality for you guys every day through just seeing things on Instagram, I just want to thank you so much for um, putting not only your experience on the line, but your your mental health, the, the, your, your safety, your creativity, just in order to tell these stories. And as someone who, you know, was born and raised here and doesn't really, you know, would never understand what you guys have been through i'm so thankful that in times of pain and hurt that you were able to create and that these stories are going to live 
past this experience, but they go, like you said, there was so much happening now and so many people are gonna be able to see themselves in these characters that you allow to become alive. So I just wanna thank y'all for sharing your stories with us. Thank you, thank you. Anyone else in the audience? No? The Any final comment maybe or question? Uh, congratulations to all the actors and, and writers. It's some beautiful work, all very well written and performed and everything. It was really a privilege to get to see it all. Um, yeah, I, the most, I think the most moving thing for me was in the scene that with the father, um, the comment that he makes about his role uh, as opposed to the invaders and their motives. And, but, and then this sort of killing and the, the referring to the enemy as not human was really powerful to me. Um, and I, I, I agree, I think it's something really special to be able to hear your guys' perspectives right now with this thing that's so important and so crazy happening. But I also think about like, oh, there's no, uh, how amazing would it be to hear a, a, a play written by a young Russian playwright as well. Um, and and Ulya, you, you touched on like, in the moment, in the day to day, what can we do? And I, I think I totally agree that it's like, oh, love is the answer. But I, I guess I'm curious what you guys think we can do. And I know it's like, you guys are so young, like how can you guys be the people responsible for telling us what to do? So I don't even wanna ask that question. But yeah, thank you all very much. Thank you, thank you. Real quick, I, um, I so much enjoyed this. And one of my favorite definitions for hope is that it enables a vision broader than this moment in time. And um, all of your work um, is just so full of rich hope. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Can you tell us what's next for this group? Are you developing full length pieces out of these works? Does it stop here? Do you undecided? Do you need resources, support? So we have a lot of things going on. We have two books coming out with Smith and Krause, so, um, we're, and we'll have book signings, and so that's uh, in the works. Um, we're there. Uh, Luca has a really wonderful uh, longer play, and um, we have a longer version of Boom, and we're working on putting, uh, doing readings of those in New York this summer and a reading, um, again, of Perfect Material with Taya um, and the actor Leah Schreiber, who's done it in the past. Um, we're trying to find a date for, and we'll make sure everyone knows about that. Um, so we have different things planned in the summer because That's meetings great. come in the summer and we'll keep meeting and we have um, all these guests come and talk and so um, some of them have made, uh, Ulya and, um, and our writer Tanya made a short film in Kyiv mm -hmm. and um, Taya made a mini short film in Kyiv. <laughs> so we're having a, a screening um, and inviting people on Zoom for that. So we just have all these plans, but individually right now, because we used to just, we'd have a goal. So we'd have everyone writing short works and then we had everyone writing 10 minute plays. And now everyone is writing, uh, working on an individual project and they're all different. We have um, someone writing a one person show and, um, and we have some full length plays and um, we have mentors to work with them on those individual projects. And we don't know where they'll, what the end is for sure. them. For the first time, we're just going to, instead of us all coming up with one thing, that we all do together. It's, we're going to kind of roll things out as they write things individually, yeah. Great, that's incredible. Yes, please. Also, Karina and I are making a documentary this summer <laughs> about um, the Ukrainian community in New York. We're gonna explore the Ukrainian village and Brooklyn and Queens, which is where I live, which is great. Um, <laughs> so yeah. That's also That's incredible. Thanks for sharing. And you have a website. Do you want to just name the website um, in case people want to check you out? What's the website? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so 
I think you can follow us on Instagram. It's Young Players Ukraine, and also our web website. If you Google Young Players Ukraine, you will find our website, and our our website is also pinned in Instagram, so you can find it there. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. It's so difficult to create something so impactful in a short whether it's a play or a film, and you guys did that beautifully. So thank you so much, and kudos to you, and thanks for being here, and totally looking forward to seeing what's next and what you all do. And thank you, Zoom World folks, for, for coming in. We so appreciate you. And what, what time is it in, what time is it for you in, in Ukraine, Ulyana? Um, well, it's 4 a.m. Oh, wow. <laughs> Get some rest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. Frank, I'll let you close out. Yeah, and again, thank everybody for participating, the actors, the directors, the writers, but also Marie Sisko for putting this together with me. China uh, behind the wheel, you know, you up there. Um, so thank you so very, very much. And to HowlRound, our uh, host online, and everybody of you taking time out of your lives to listen to these stories um, from from Ukraine. It's very important, I think, what we heard today. I'm sorry we had to cut the panel in between. We went a bit over time, but we would like to thank you, and um, I hope you all will be back here. And maybe if you can do host them or bring them over or do something, you know, that would be would be wonderful. So thank you all so much, and um, check out our film program. It's coming up. We're doing a big international film festival, also a film, I think, from Ukraine is part of it. We have over 30 films. Some of them we will screen live here at the Siegel Center, which is Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and next Monday. But uh, about 20 or 25 films will be available online. It's all work by theater artists created for the screen. Thank you. Hey. I had a feeling so. <laughs>